Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I would like to call this regular meeting of the Board of Education to order. The next regular Board of Educating meeting is on Tuesday. Um, Tuesday what? This does not have, what's 28th. that? 28th. 28th um, at 7.30 in the board meeting room. So thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you all for joining us this evening uh, in person and on Zoom. Um, we have a full house here and uh, we have a full house online and we have some folks outside that when it comes time for public comment, we'll work those people in. We just have to be um, cognizant of um, spacing and distancing in the boardroom. So I wanna thank all those parents and community members that have sent emails and letters to the board providing comments and thoughts. All those emails are shared with the full board and the administration. I wanna thank everyone for being engaged and thank you for those that are gonna speak this evening. We continue to be a district that is recognized for our commitment to in-person learning and working together to have the right protocols in place for a safe learning environment for our students, teachers, and staff. We are going to stay focused on that safe learning environment for our teachers, students, and staff. And as previously mentioned, we are operating under the governor's executive mandate, which includes a mask mandate. This executive order, unless extended, expires on September 30th. We will continue to monitor that and keep the community informed as things change. We appreciate all the community's thoughts around masks and will continue to work with the state and local health professionals as this potentially changes. The agenda tonight includes topics of curriculum and also diversity, equity, and inclusion. Very important topics that are and continue to be part of the district and the board's work. These topics are worked on and discussed daily and have been part of the great work done by the strategic plan committee that includes people from across our community. The board and the administration is appreciative of the recent parent concerns related to curriculum. This is not just a local, but state and national issue. And there's a heightened awareness around a lot of these topics. In my almost eight years on the board, the board has always been involved and plays a role in the oversight of curriculum. We ensure the district the state mandates and balances our community values in educating our students. We are provided regular updates on our curriculum and it is available online. Our professional team uses the curriculum, test textbooks and online resources that work with the curriculum. We'll hear more all about that this evening from Dr. Adley and Mr. Tranberg. We value the incredible administration and teachers that dedicate their careers with incredible passion, especially during this pandemic to making sure we create an environment of educated critical thinkers that are prepared for college, a profession and to be influential members of our society. I do think it's critical that this board and the community see the value of our professional educators day to day, day to day, and having them have their creativity and autonomy in reaching the district's educational goals. We are a high performing district recognized not just at the state level, but nationally, almost on an annual basis. We are doing so many things right. There is always room for discussion and we always wanna hear from our students, parent and community. Tonight, we'll begin the discussion with the administration on curriculum as part of a normal board update, but also to educate and listen to the community. We'll also start to hear about the administration's work on diversity, equity, and inclusion. These discussions will continue at a regular or at additional special board meetings. Our goal is to listen, learn, help educate, work with the community, and make sure we all feel and see the transparency in our educational process. I would end with two requests. One is understanding and helping everyone to understand the chain of command in our schools. I think it's important that people understand the incredible administrators that are in our elementary schools, our middle school and our high school. There's assistant principals, there's teachers, there's principals, there's psychologists. There are so many people to speak to and understanding the chain of command, we will help do a better job of communicating that. But please understand that as you have challenges with your child or you have questions, it's the teacher, it's the school, it's the assistant principal, it's the principal. You always have the opportunity to reach out board members or reach out to the administration, but it really should start with your student's teacher and work up from there. Um, the other ask is while social media is part of our lives, having the facts, the context, and asking the questions of the professionals will make sure we all stay on the same page. We have an incredible administration and team of teachers and a dedicated group of nine volunteers on this board 
working to ensure we continue to be a high performing district, preparing our students for the real world and its challenges. I wanna thank you again for always participating, for all the feedback. We do this as a community, keeping our kids in school safe and healthy. So thank you very much. Uh, moving on. We will move on to public comment. So Michelle, we will work public comment with the folks in the audience first. And then uh, once we are finished with the folks in the audience, our gentleman outside will tag the next person in line that can come in and speak. And we'll have people come through that way. I think it's the most efficient way to do it. And then we'll move to our friends on Zoom. So um, we're good, Michelle. So I'll ask the first person that wants public comment, please step up to that chair and that microphone. And Michelle, you'll go over the rules of engagement for public comment. Good evening. If you would like to speak during public comment, please click the participants icon on the bottom of your Zoom screen if you're joining us via Zoom. Next, click the raise hand option. You will notice a blue hand icon appear on the upper corner of your screen where your face, name, and or number appears. When it is your turn to speak, the facilitator will identify you and announce that you are unmuted for public comment. Once recognized and unmuted, please state your name and address. You will have up to three minutes to comment. Thank you, sir. Go ahead. Um, this is for uh, Alan. Uh, what restrictions do teachers have on polling our students about their- uh, So, sir, I'm not sure we'll, we can educate everyone on public, co public comment is we just hear your public comments. Okay. It's not a question and answer okay. session. So okay. if you could okay. also just start out with your name and your address. Yeah. My name and then, is Joe Martin. I live at 13 Little Brook Road, there you Thank you. Okay. Then my comment is that I'm sick and tired of my daughters crying every night after homework assignments and in-class assignments because they're being outed as conservatives. Okay. I'm a conservative. My wife's a conservative. I'm a proud conservative. I'm sick and tired. It ends now. Simple as that. Okay. Enough's enough. We will not stand by. It's a free country. My father escaped communism and fascism come here for free speech and to build his own free life. And my, my maternal grandparents are the same from Italy. So I'm done, I'm sick and tired. This is not education, it's indoctrinate, indoctrination, simple as that. There's no other way you can spin it and it's gonna end now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Next person from the audience. Thank you. <clears throat> Just please, yeah, adjust the mic as you see fit. Thank you. I'm Amy Zerby and I live at Nine More House Drive. I'm coming to speak to you tonight to tell you about my children's experience at the Darien Public Schools. I currently have a sophomore and senior and my kids have been attending the Darien Public Schools since kindergarten. I showed my senior the recent Facebook post of a Board of Ed candidate and asked them if they ever experienced what the candidate was alleging and their response was, LOL, no, their history teachers were very insistent on not telling the students their political ideology. Last year, one of my children, as well as a few of yours, was lucky enough to take American history during one of the most turbulent and exciting times in recent history. My child was excited to tell me about what they were working on in class. They had open-ended projects on 2020 events, as well as post-World War II topics, and discussed the January 6th siege on the Capitol building. Opinions ranged from the far left to the far right with no jeering from the students nor criticism from the teacher. Since a few of your children took this class last year, I am certain that you would have shared your concerns with us. This year, a number of parents have complained about the way race and politics are being taught. Is this a 180 from how these topics were previously discussed or is there something else at play like politics? Politicians have been playing on people's fears on topics such as critical race theory, gender identity, and indoctrination in order to pass legislation that limits what can be taught in schools. Across Connecticut, I see prospective Board of Ed candidates using this method in hopes of getting elected, which is the case here in Darien. Parents are being conditioned to scrutinize class materials for any hint of critical race theory and diversity, equity, and inclusion. Last Friday, I heard that there was a group of people gathered at a Board of Ed building, this Board of Ed building, so I went down to check it out. I approached a group of people and asked them what was going on. They didn't know, but said that someone texted them asking them to show up. I was able to glean that there was a parent who wanted to speak with the administration about how CRT is being taught in the schools, 
However, it is unclear if that was the case. It is apparent that these people were asked to show up purely for the appearance of support, smoke and mirrors, political theater. The schools need to prepare our children for life after they leave the Darien schools and bubble. The Board of Ed recently unanimously passed the Darien Public School Strategic Plan for 2021 to 2026. As you know, this plan includes the portrait of the graduate and a vision of core values, including wellness, collaboration, diversity, inclusion, equity, excellence, innovation, respect, and civility. I strongly support this strategic plan and agree that the implementation will prepare our students for a successful life after high school. I am concerned that the vocal minority of frightened parents will have a negative impact on the outcomes of our children's education. And I urge you to rise above politics and not be swayed. Amy, I Thank didn't you. catch your street address. Oh, Nine More House Drive. Thank, Thank you, you, Mrs. Zerby. Do I have anyone else from the audience? Thank you. Teresa Vote, 22 Circle Road. Explore interests outside of my comfort zone. I use perspective taking inquiry and synth synthesis skills to better understand others. I engage respectfully with individuals and groups whose thinking is different from my own. I courageously seek to move beyond personal bias and social constructs. These are just a few of the tenets stated in our vision of the graduate, a vision that was voted on and approved on June 22nd by those board members present that day with the lone dissent from David Brown. I am the parent of a DHS graduate and a current DHS senior. My college sophomore spoke to me the year she took AP Law and Gov about a Pew survey the class took that showed where you currently land on the political spectrum. The survey is given as a way to teach the students about how one's views of the world are most often informed by their personal bias and experiences. No judgments, no shame, no discomfort. It was simply a lesson. My current high school senior told me that last year he too received the graphic that many seem so upset about tonight. According to him, the graphic is used as a resource to help inform a more balanced and well-rounded view of a current or historical event. That he and his peers were encouraged and often required to cite primary sources from every point of view. No judgments, no shame, no discomfort, simply a lesson. That said, there will be times that children will be made to feel uncomfortable. They will be presented with points of view that may differ from what they learn at home. They may find that they have vastly differing points of view and values from their friends. But this is what their education is all about because ultimately it is about learning to think critically and learning to question, understand, and accept. It is about becoming responsible and thoughtful global citizens when they enter the next stage of their lives. It is the vision of our graduate. Friday's protests and the outcry on social media from parents are actually the antithesis of that vision. If anything, these protests border on censorship and they are a part of a larger strategy nationwide that uses the education of our children as a political pawn. I have seen emails from Friday's protesters who are questioning the discussions around pronouns and religion. These are the topics that are relevant to what is happening in the world around us and very much in the lives of our students. In fact, every college I am currently looking at with my son asks, what pronouns do you use and how do you identify yourself? Our schools are the success that they are because of the professionals who research and implement curriculum, because they push our kids to think critically and accept all views. I am speaking tonight because I cannot idly sit by as others seek to undermine those professionals and instill fear in others for their own political gain. Thank you, Mrs. Vogt. Anyone else from the audience? Kate Bates, 33 Ridgely Street in Darien. Um, hello, everybody. I know many of you here, and I finally found my way to the BOE building, so clearly I don't come here often. Um, Dr. Adley and members of the board, thank you for taking the time to hear us tonight. As many of you are aware, I met with Dr. Adley and Mr. Tramberg on Friday to discuss an incident that happened in my daughter's 11th grade 
history class in the early days of this school year. I am grateful to Dr. Adley and Mr. Tranberg for taking the meeting. And I'm also grateful to the more than 70 parents who showed up at the Board of Education building to show their support and concern that morning. There were no protests. It was literally women having a cup of coffee and being there, that's it. So misinformation. I wanna to start tonight by saying that I firmly believe no one in this district has ill intentions for our children. I believe everyone involved is trying to do the right thing. We all want our children to be open-minded, to respect others and to think for themselves. I believe we are all striving to create an educational environment that feels safe for everyone, is rooted in inclusivity and tolerance. And I feel confident that if we can maintain an open dialogue between parents, teachers, the administration, and the board, the best possible outcome will be achieved for our students. I have raised a stepdaughter who has gone through Darien High School. I have a junior and I also have a seventh grader and I have the utmost respect for this school, for their teachers, and I have never raised my hand to complain about anything. I send them to school and truly believe they are in safe hands. This is the first time I have seen something that really raised a red flag. And I, I knew that I needed to say something. And uh, I, I definitely went through it with my family, with my parents. We looked at it and we just felt, no, something's wrong. My daughter came home from school upset, confused. She was told to stand up and write after taking a Pew survey that was then sent to the Pew Research Center. And she was given a diagram that none of it even, she didn't understand any of it. It was so completely skewed. Now, if they were handed this as satire and told to look at it in that way, okay, that's fine, but they weren't. They were clearly given a red and blue diagram that said left and right. And I don't think it was flattering to either side. So to me, this is a bipartisan discussion. I'm curious how the curriculum got into her hands. I'm curious why they were told to take a binary survey that I couldn't answer. I challenge all of you to answer it. I challenge you by the end of this board meeting to take a look at it, read it, answer all the questions, and then go up on the board and write whether you're a, a Democrat or a Mrs. Republican. Bates, you're, you're at time, Mrs. Bates. Oh, so to, to finish up, Ultimately, if 16 year olds are forced to do this and we don't want to do this, it really shouldn't be there. And I hope we can have um, some a, a chain of communication and protocol and some oversight on the curriculum. And that's all I'm asking. And I appreciate your time. Thank you, Mr. Bates. Hello, my name is Nancy Herget, and I'm at 30 Tower Lane. All curriculum-based education should have checks and balances, transparency, a point of reference to evaluate, to always improve. More than a few complaints justify this action to resolve. When repetition occurs, repetition of unwarranted situations, it requires a discussion, an action, and an evaluation. Many complaints have been brought to teachers over the years. We have been in the Darien school system since 2001. We're almost hitting 20 years and I still have a seventh grade. So we have quite a vast experience of interacting with many teachers, uh, department chairs and things like that. Um, some issues get resolved by teachers. Most do that, that I have personally had with my kids' teachers. Um, Complaints to department heads, department chairpersons, superintendent, even board of ed. And as of late, I haven't seen or heard any plan to resolve and change what is happening on a daily basis, weekly basis, monthly, whatever it is, um, in the classrooms. If anything, it seems like more problems are escalating. Biased, leading, opinionated teaching is inexcusable, inappropriate, and wrong. You might say, oh, we don't want that or condone that kind of teaching. We all don't want that. And I realize that.
But I'm telling you, it's happening and it's out there and it's in the classrooms, not in every classroom, but it's there. And when you are told what happens to the teacher or instruction that's given to the department heads, what, what, what happens, what's to be done? All good educators know that it is possible to be a great teacher while eliminating your opinion specifically on politics, religion, voting, money income, unless that class was specifically selected by the student, which usually occurs in the older high school grades. It's not anyone's business at this level age for schooling. It says on your website, which I value tremendously, under rules and responsibilities of the Board of Ed, quote, you are the foundation of accountability, close quote. I honor this. We teach our kids to honor this, to be accountable, to be accountable for your choices and your actions. How come I am not seeing this happen regularly? Accountability for teachers, for anybody that might do something small that's wrong, but there's not been much accountability. Accountability is justified when an issue is resolved. The state of Connecticut education curriculum for middle sex and high school levels is clear. I couldn't find anywhere where it says to eliminate textbooks for US history in our classrooms, nor can I find anywhere where it says pick Mrs. a Hergott, prominent you're almost, person. You're almost at time. Okay. Pick a prominent person in US history, pick them apart, only use two references of information to prove that that said individual was a bad person. Any young 11 and 14 year old who is given negative resources will conclude that that, that, that individual was bad. This is Sergei, you're at time. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you for Thank listening. You. My name is Natasha Tomai. I live at 6 McLaren Road South. And I was part of the group of 60 or 70 parents who gathered here outside of the building on Friday morning. There was not one of us who did not know the reason we were here. The reason we were here is that there was exposure to very polarizing material in the high school. There were questions asked of 11-year-old 11, 11 girls to identify their gender. There's discussions about religion. And each one of us had a concern of having politics, religion, sexual preference or identity kept out of the classroom. If at some point these, um, if politics come into the classroom, my recommendation would be make it a, an elective, um, you know, in the 11th grade and the 12th grade, there is a reason, um, and, and the age sensitivity is a big piece here, an 11 year old being asked to identify as a he, she is a very difficult question to answer. Um, at 11, I mean, imagine going home and your parents having to figure out how to explain why that question was asked. I think as parents, we need resources um, so that we're prepared to answer those types of questions. Um, so the age sensitivity, sensitivity piece is something, the elective piece, there should be nonpartisan material introduced into the classroom. We should have some oversight. Again, the accountability piece, where does the buck stop? I read the letter in response, Dr. Adley's letter responding to our questions. Um, he did not answer the question of whether or not uh, there was booing going on in the classroom, which I've been told that there was. Um, what kind of teacher allows kids to be booed for declaring a political party who are actually underage minors who don't have a political party? There is a reason that our children cannot vote, drink, die for the country um, until they're 18. Their brains are simply not developed enough to make those types of decisions. So introducing inflammatory material, framing it in a certain way, and then asking them to publicly um, declare their positions on those topics is incredibly inappropriate. There needs to be accountability. We need, and I don't know if it's through freedom of information or what, to be able to see the material like that diagram that was handed out. I want to see those types of things before they go out. The parents should be prepared to field these questions when they come home. And politics, quite frankly, should be kept out of the classroom. If kids want to talk about current events outside of their homes and their peer group, they can take that in as an elective. I can turn my TV off. I can choose what I read in the morning. I can choose what I listen to. I can walk away. My boss never asked me what my party I belong to. Okay, if he did, I would, be, I would be shocked. He never asked me what religion I was either or what my sexual preferences were. But if I'm in, in 11th grade classroom, I have to listen to that. I can't turn my TV off. I can't turn the radio off. So don't expose our kids to things that, that they don't need to be listening to at this age. That, that responsibility lies within the parents. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening. My name is Todd Herget. I live at uh, 30 Tower Lane. I'm going to pick up where my wife left off. The state of Connecticut education curriculum for middle school and high school levels is clear. I couldn't find anywhere where it says eliminate textbooks for US history, nor can I find anywhere where it says pick a prominent person in US history, pick him apart or her apart, use only two references of information to prove that said individual was a bad person. Any young 11 to 14 year old who is given negative resources will conclude that the individual was bad. Speaking specifically about the history curriculum, it is about learning facts, people, places, events in the past. You cannot change what was already happened, what has already happened. You can learn from it, about it, personal choices that affected history. This is called a foundation. When you're old enough, age appropriate discussions, debates can occur only if you have a solid foundation of knowledge. If you present an idea, a topic, a person when there is no foundational knowledge, secured and you ask students to dig deeper, be more critical thinkers of, of sorts by reading biased leading resources, then you are actually grooming the students in an abusive educational way. This kind of teaching has no good intentions but to form opinions and lead them down a groomed path. This has no place in our school system, nor should it be left in place in our curriculum to continually distract, bully, plant dark ideas, negativity, pessimism of thoughts and ideas, even images from photos or movies when using these resources or by allowing teachers to continue to teach in this manner and not take appropriate action on the curriculum. We all need more goodness in our lives. Our kids need more positivity and light while they are young and impressionable through high school. We all do. Let me just reiterate that we've lived in this community for um, over 20 years, and we've had six children go through the public school systems. One of the reasons why we sought out this community was for the exceptionality of the schools. And that begins here, and that continues as well in the homes. The two most important groups in education are parents and educators. And there's a real need that there be clear transparency and accountability. And maybe now is one of those times where that needs to be stressed more than ever more than ever. We're grateful for the service that you render on behalf of our students, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Ergot. Anyone else in the audience like to speak? Can we see who's, Alan, who's checking the door? See if there's anyone outside who would like to come in. Thank you. Nobody outside? Okay. There are people outside. Great. Okay. No, I just want to check and there'll be public comment toward the end. Thank you, everyone that's in the audience for speaking. Michelle, I'll turn it over to you in our world of Zoom. John Dunn, you are unmuted and recognized. Good evening. My name is John Dunn. I live at 175 Raymond Street. It was upsetting to hear that within Mr. days of returning to- Mr. Dunn, could you just speak up a little louder, please? Yes, of course. My apologies. Thank you so much. My name is John Dunn and I live at 175 Raymond Street. It was upsetting to hear that within days of returning to the classroom, daring high schoolers were being subjected to divisive teaching material in an American studies course. As a parent, I found it heartbreaking that as an 11th grader was brought to tears after being booed simply for expressing her political beliefs to her fellow classmates. Is this type of inflammatory teaching and behavior occurring on a regular basis in our classrooms? In addition to this, the unempathetic and tone deaf response from Superintendent Adley was equally troubling. In his closing comments and his response to the parents, and I would encourage all those listening to read his entire email, Superintendent Adley stated, quote, I would hope during these challenging times that we will be respectful in our discourse to one another, end quote. 
Yet the very graphic that started all of this was far from respectful and at best placed to untrue, biased and ignorant stereotypes. And how is it respectful discourse when a student leaves the classroom in tears? In my view, that sounds more like school approved bullying. The only bright spot in all of this were the dozens and dozens and dozens of concerned parents that showed up at the Board of Ed Friday morning to support the mother of the aforementioned student and tell their own concerning stories of what is happening in our schools. Parents are rightfully upset. Our children deserve an unbiased education. We do not want political and partisan activism in our classrooms hidden under the guise of critical thinking. Darian students, parents, and taxpayers need curriculum transparency and oversight now. Thank you for the time. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. Katrina O'Connor, you are unmuted and recognized. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can, Ms. O'Connor, thank you. Hi, sorry, I'm multi, I was gonna try to be there in person, but I'm multitasking, attending a, 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 another college Zoom uh, for my, my uh, senior. So I'll just keep it quick. Um, I had sent my comments us, ahead. Just provide us your address also, Mrs. O'Connor. Yes, 15 Highland Avenue in Darien. Thank you. Um, my husband and I have lived in town and raised our children here. We've been here about almost 20 years. Um, I have a son, an eighth grader at Middlesex Middle School, uh, a senior at a private Jesuit high school in the Bronx, and a college sophomore who also attended the same high school in New York, where they both took advanced placement law and government. So different school, different state. They participated in the same Pew Research exercise as was described by this small group of parents at their, which I thought was a rally, but now I'm learning it's a coffee. Um, the survey in question, at our school at least, and what I understand is part of the advanced placement law and government curriculum, um, which is a college board advanced class, um, is designed to introduce students to the concept of a political spectrum and how it informs policy, law, and government. It is designed to help students understand diversity of thought, as well as common ground in belief systems as they affect the political landscape. If in fact that there was booing and cheering as students checked off their results, then I think that speaks less about the exercise and the curriculum and volumes about the students in that classroom. Analyzing political cartoons has been around as long as textbooks. I think most of us can remember doing these exercises with old World War II, uh, you know, old newspapers. And these teachers use this method to offer visual representations of the events that are happening around them, complex issues to draw students healthy debate and honing their critical skills. Those parents that are concluding that this instructional method is some sort of attempt at indoctrination likely missed out on the benefits of a really good rigorous debate in an advanced history class. Middle schoolers, like mine, are bombarded by images every day on social media and on the news. The images of Black Lives Matter protests and the attack on the nation's capital on January 6th were widely circulated in their Facebook, Snapchat, and Instagram feeds. Their parents are watching it on TV at home. Why wouldn't the teachers at, the, at one of the state's top middle schools engage their students in critical discussion of real, no, Connor, you're almost at time. Okay, of real historical events. Why would parents want to prevent their kids from listening to a viewpoint different from their own in a safe educational environment? What are they so afraid of? And my last point: members of board, members of the board of education and board of finance who help promote division, hysteria, misinformation through social media, email blasts, and fear tactics and rallies not only fail the community they are mandated to serve, but also render their boards antiquated and irrelevant in a world that is today becoming more inclusive, diverse, and forward-thinking. Consider no stepping aside if you are unwilling to support the Darien Public That's, Schools Administration. Time, Thank, you. Honor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dan Magui, you are unmuted and recognized. Hi, I'm obviously not Dan Magui. I'm Carolina Magui. Carolina, if you could if you could speak up a little bit, it would help. Thank you so much. Okay, um, I'll try. 
Thank um, you. Carolina Magoli, 28 Cancer. Um, the world is no longer the world we were raised in. As much as many people would like to contain the rapid pace that our world is changing at, we can't. Our children, who mostly have devices provided by us parents, have access to that same world with someone somehow want to shelter them from. They see their news in Instagram, Snapchat, and TikTok, and whatever social media accounts they have. They follow people who use pronouns that might not be what you or I identify with, or the ones we were used to see. They go to class with other children that might have two dads or two moms. They see a lot of graphic content through these devices that we gave them, and we might not be aware about that. The news and the TV shows are also different to what we grew up with. But like it or not, we need to adapt and we need to prepare them from the, for that world that they will go to. Darien as a community is like a bubble of very similar people. I know that firsthand because I'm part of the difference in town. The world is not Darien. Real things are happening out there that our kids are aware of. Trust me, they know what is going on out there. I want our schools to prepare my children to face that world. I want them to prepare them to think critically about everything. I want them to provide them with tools that will make them su succeed in life. And by that, I don't mean to get a big paycheck. I want my child to be a productive member of the society that we live in, which is definitely more diverse, more inclusive and more progressive. That might make some people uncomfortable, but it is a fact that we can avoid. I've had conversation with my current freshmen in the high school that have been eye openers because they know a lot more than we think they do. And what I see is a young lady who is much more open to ideas, to acceptance, to knowledge and to debate than I ever was at 14. But that is the world that we live in. It's 2021 and not 1950. And I want a curriculum that reflects that. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. McGooey. <clears throat> Julie Punishil, you are unmuted and recognized. Thank you, Julie Punishil, 23 Fitch Avenue. I use the title of Ms., please. Today I'm reading a letter on behalf of Henry Canlian of 9 McLaren Road, Darien High School class of 21. This letter was emailed to all of the members of the board. Dear Dr. Adley and members of the board, I graduated in June of this year from Darien High School. I attended Darien High School and the public schools of Darien for my entire primary school education. Without a doubt, the most important skill that Darien High School taught me was my ability to think critically. As I go forward into the world and meet countless new and educated people, I am still shocked how easily it is for people to be misled by false and biased information. Darien High School taught me and so many others how to sift through the false information that perforates our society. Darien High School is ranked consistently within the top three public high schools in the state. The high test scores that we value so dearly are not a result of students being able to memorize and feedback bland information. It is the direct result of creating an environment of higher and more critical thinking. To challenge and question the curriculum of teachers to whom we call the best of the best would be preposterous. The teaching staff of DHS has never led the students, parents, or the board wrong. We owe them an incredible debt and a great degree of gratitude. I hope that it, as you are inundated with emails from angry parents who know little about the stellar teaching staff and curriculum at our schools, that you remember that it is this very curriculum which makes us the community that you serve, the brightest, smartest, and most educated group of young thinkers in the state. Do not fold to a small, loud minority of misinformed parents but instead listen to the teachers and staff members who we should trust implicitly. Sincerely, Henry Canlian, 9 McLaren Road, Darien, Connecticut, Darien High School graduate, class of 21. Ms. Bushnell, thank you very much. Sophia Tallwalker, you are unmuted and recognized. Hi, I'm Sophia Tallwalker of 219 Hollow Tree Ridge Road. I would just like to say that I graduated from Darien High School in 2020. 
I attended the Darien Public Schools for all of my primary education, and I now attend Northwestern University. My education at Darien High School was full and rich and prepared me well for the academic rigor of college. We were taught to look at information from multiple perspectives and to thoroughly examine all sources for biased thinking. We were taught to be free thinkers, to form our own opinions based on the multitude of digital information we see on a daily basis. We engaged in healthy debates or Socratic seminars as we called them, analyzed political cartoons as Mrs. O'Connor said, and examined political speeches from all areas of the political spectrum. However, the one area that I was not prepared in was diversity and inclusion. I started my first year at Northwestern University immediately with diversity and inclusion training, along with sexual harassment and drug and alcohol abuse training. And as I went through this program, I realized that in the 18 years that I had lived in Darien, I had never once heard the terms diversity and inclusion training. I had never once been taught that somebody could identify completely differently than me. And although I had learned that from being on the internet all these years and learning about the Black Lives Matter movement, it had never been discussed in school. And I thought that was very interesting because Darien High School ranks so highly among all of the education systems across America. So I urge students and parents today to support this movement towards diversity and inclusion training. And to the parents, I say, whether you like it or not, one day your student will go through this training at the prestigious college that you hope for them to attend one day, at the six figure job that you hope they have. They will go through this training. Why not start at the high school age? Why not start before they enter out into the real world, before they have the chance to unknowingly offend somebody or unknowingly cause a microaggression? And I ask the parents who are against this addition to the curriculum, why? Why are you against diversity and inclusion training? What is the harm in learning to respect pronouns, learning to respect race, learning to respect one another's identities? This issue is not political, the bottom line. I don't understand why it is becoming political in our town. This is not an attack on our school nor on this town to want to improve the curriculum and improve the experiences of all students, regardless of how they identify. Also, I would like to add that communism is an economic theory that has nothing to do with gender, sexuality, race, or this discussion. Thank you very much for your time. Ms. Talwalker, thank you very much. Username Faud Ambargi, you are unmuted and recognized. Hello everyone, this is Fuad Anbarji. I'm at 40 Tulip Tree Lane. Um, and I have uh, three kids that have gone through the uh, Darien High School system, the Darien Educational System. Um, I want to say just a couple of things. Uh, for, first off, uh, obviously uh, we wanna create an environment where um, we are creating a tolerant, accepting, uh, inclusive, environment and that means inclusive for everyone whether you're progressive or conservative religious not religious and so i appreciate uh, some of the commentary from uh, some of the parents who object to uh, these materials um, having said that you, you should all be aware that um, that sensitivity applies both ways uh, i'm a parent of three children my eldest child is, uh, is a trans child uh, who do who does have um, uh, a preference in terms of how they identify. Uh, it's been a complex uh, transition for them and for the whole family. And um, that's been uh, our family's challenge and certainly one that we hope the school environment uh, would make um, simpler for those kids that are coming through that have gender identity issues. Um, there's also, um, uh, my, my, I'm an Arab American and my child has been called a terrorist on the bus in public schools uh, my, my daughter, final, uh, final daughter, um, also has had many, many issues given the color of her skin. She has an Asian mother, uh, an Arab father, and uh, has been otherized in this environment. And so while I appreciate the tears and concerns from some of these other students, and there's no place for that, there's no place for that kind of exclusion or discrimination either for people who don't identify with the majority 
um, uh, in Darien. Um, having said that, I wanna just end with a uh, commentary on the quality of the school system. I think the um, Darien has proven to be an amazing, amazing educational system. I think uh, what you're doing, you're doing great and continue doing it. I, for one, uh, took that Pew test, did not find it that controversial. I found it really intuitive and interesting to figure out where you fit along a political spectrum. I, for what is worth, was somewhat in the middle. I also saw that chart showing um, uh, how you align on a political spectrum. This isn't about politics. This is about teaching kids what the world is around them. And in this polarized society, where you might fit in, not so as to become more polarized, but so as to understand the other side. I think Darianne's doing a fantastic job. My senior, my, my eldest uh, is a graduate from UPenn. My middle guy is a rower at uh, BU. And my last one is a um, current student at Harvard. And I'm just gonna read her statement. As a current freshman studying econ at Harvard, I am more than prepared due to my high school education. Thanks to DHS extensive social studies electives like AP Econ and Philosophy, I'm able to stand out in section discussions and keep up with lectures. Sorry. Okay. Excellent job. Thank you all. Keep doing what you're doing. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambardi. Jackie's iPhone, you are unmuted and recognized. <laughs> Can you hear us, Jackie? Sorry, it's, it's actually your husband, Bill Lenich. We live at 1 Silenoy Road in Darien. Did you just say your last name again, sir? Lenich. Thank you. So uh, Dr. Adley, let's address your first remarks. Uh, the chain of command, you forgot the top and, and that's the parents. We're the top of the pyramid when it comes to the education of our children. You guys all work for us, the taxpayers, and it's our children that are in the classroom. Any teacher's lesson that applies their lessons to the home dynamic between parents and their children should be out of bounds, frankly. The previous reference diagram was exactly this. It said explicitly that some parents do so out of fear. How life, home life is a personal and private environment and is absolutely out of bounds for any teacher or school. To boil this down, I think it's actually simple. I've heard the word equity and CRT already tonight. Frankly, CRT curriculum is abhorrent. If my children are sub subjugated to it, we'll react, react accordingly. And the condescension exhibited towards moms and dads gathering near the school board meeting is noted. That was classy. If you want partners or patients with regard to your relationships with parents or our children, teaching CRT and acting in such a way is the best way to destroy it. It's been suggested to step aside by some parents here. <laughs> Good luck with that. As parents, our primary goal is to protect and nurture our children, and we will do exactly that. Thank you, Mr. Lenich. Could he repeat his statement? Excuse me? You got that? Okay. Michelle? Username Deb, you are unmuted and recognized. Can you hear us, Deb? Deb, you need to unmute. Can you hear Hi, us? I just unmuted. Great. Can you hear me? Yes, just your name and address. Thank you. Hi, I'm Deb Latham. I'm at 429 Hoyt Street. I wasn't planning on speaking tonight, um, but after listening to many of the comments, some which were like really super, um, others questionable, I think we're forgetting like what probably the main issue is here. It's that some children were booed for identifying with a certain political party. And I think that's the big issue here. And that says a lot about what's going on in this town with parents who have very strong political views and what they're teaching our kids. And I think, would a child be booed for not getting a good grade on an exam? No. Would they be booed for, um, not making you know the final touchdown at the turkey bowl no but they're being booed for identifying with a certain political view and i think that's like the biggest issue of all is that we need to support and accept 
our kids and our neighbors, no matter where they side and come together as a community. Who cares what political party you follow? We're one community. And I think that's um, the big issue here is that some kids were really made to feel like dirt because they were treated very poorly by their peers. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clayton. Are you on the phone, boy? <laughs> C. McCarth, you are unmuted and recognized. You're still muted, ma'am. Mrs. McCarth, you're still muted. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Just state your name and address, please. Thank you. Christina McCarthy, 25 Hillside Avenue. Go ahead. Thank, thank you me. to the board for listening to us, to all parents, to all thoughts. I agree with Mr. Lenich. We are here to nurture and guide our children. We want partnership with the educators. That is all we are here to ask. As a parent of a new sixth grader, my oldest child, I have so many concerns of what I'm hearing between culture surveys, different surveys. What gender are you? What religion are you? Age sensitivity has to play a factor. I'd like to know who predicts age sensitivity? And how does it end up in the classroom without minors, parents being aware? Thank you, and thank you for listening to me. Mrs. McCarthy, thank you very much. There are no more raised hands at this time. Okay, thank you, Michelle. Thank you for all those folks in the audience. Thank you for the folks standing outside that maybe can hear me through the window. And thank you for all those folks on Zoom. Uh, again, we're listening, we're hearing you. We appreciate all the comments and, and all the feedback. Thank you very much for participating. And there'll be more public comment at the end. Um, we'll move along to the superintendent's report, Dr. Adley. Uh, good evening, everybody, and uh, special. Welcome to the people who are in front of us. And uh, again, thank you to the parents uh, who are participating. In some ways, it seems that it's been, school has just started, but in other ways, it seems like we've been back for over a month or, or so, uh, so much as has actually happened. But I, I don't want to forget our, um, the start of school in, so, in many ways, because it was a strong start to the school year, given uh, where we have been, uh, e even though our, our school system and our teachers and community has provided an excellent in-person education. It's just wonderful to see all the kids come back through the school doors. There was passion and excitement from our, our staff members, from our students, and also from our parents. Can I just thank all the members of the PTOs and anyone who participated with giving a special welcome back to school, balloons, supplies, decorations, signs. Uh, that's why we, we do what we do here. And that's why this place is so special at the end of the day. So thank you for that. I can tell you that the seniors were just as excited about the opening of the school as were our kindergarten students and our ELP students. Uh, buses for this year, it always takes a little bit of time for those to settle down. And I wanna thank particularly those parents and community members and students on bus 25 and bus five. Uh, those have been particularly problematic. And uh, it seems like we've, finally uh, been able to come to terms with some of the variables that we were dealing with. And uh, we've now got that those buses are able to arrive on time. But again, we appreciate both your feedback and also your, your uh, uh, patience as we work through those. In fact, I would like to thank the, the, the management of First Student. We're very fortunate for the bus company that we have, the management there, the leadership that we have. If you're not aware, there are bus shortages across the state of Connecticut. Uh, there were several school systems that actually did not open on time because of that. Uh, so uh, the bus companies are, are struggling with uh, drivers and we're struggling with the process to actually get that uh, certified at uh, motor vehicles. And uh, we're trying to, uh, various organizations are trying to speed that particular process up. That has impacted some of our sports, uh, which I've communicated. And again, I thank the, uh, the parents, particularly from, uh, particularly from Gulf, and um, uh, swimming, uh, they have made some accommodations and uh, which has, has included taking a, a bus being dropped off and others uh, 
we're relying on your transportation for now. So we thank you uh, for that. I would like just one more mention of uh, on Friday and Saturday, our schools participated in different events, uh, which honored all those that lost their lives on September 11th uh, on the 20th anniversary, for all those who still grieve and for the heroic actions of first responders and citizens. Uh, it was nice to see everyone again uh, come together uh, for that particular purpose and honor uh, those particular groups of people. Our elementary students made, made cards and pictures and wrote letters to Darian, firefighters, police officers, nurses, doctors, and first responders. And uh, so uh, we extend again another uh, words of appreciation and gratitude to these special people. Thank you also to the Henley community for accommodating. We've had storms and closures even in the past week or so. Uh, those two days will be made up most likely at the end of the school year, but we'll come back with a, a definitive on that. Uh, staff, and I'm glad to report that we are fully staffed at this particular point. Um, the, the last remaining vacancy was filled with about 50, 52 uh, new teachers. Uh, we did receive word or sort of word through the grant system, uh, no official communication, but the American Rescue Act IDA grant, uh, we have received uh, 199,000 and that's specifically for K through 12 recovery services. It has to go to recovery services and an additional about $18,000 that has to go to recovery services uh, for preschool. Uh, so you'll hear a little bit more about that uh, this evening. I want to also recognize Chartwells, uh, our food company. And not only did they do a super job last year in helping us navigate COVID-19, uh, but they've done a super job in sort of ratcheting up uh, right this uh, early in the year, the offerings, particularly at the middle school and high school uh, for students, but really right across the district. And um, there's physical improvements and there's also a lot of uh, nutrition improvement Ask your students, ask your children, they'll, they'll, they'll tell you that it's, it, it's a good service. And um, also thank them for uh, taking over the snack shack for us and the first event there was this past weekend. Thank you to parents and staff for accommodating the virtual open houses. Hopefully those were well received. Uh, and my sense is that they were well received. Middlesex will be next week, uh, as will the uh, high school will be on the 23rd. Uh, the seventh and eighth graders, uh, the mountain workshop is happening this week. So people are getting to know each other uh, again. And the, the, as part of the orientation and uh, sixth grade will participate on September 20th and 28th. I do want to say a special thank you to uh, the students at the high school, the young people who helped out in the ninth grade orientation. Uh, those, those, uh, there's nothing more intimidating, I don't think, than going to the high school as a freshman. And uh, the young people who are there, uh, the older classmen, uh, helped out and made that a very successful uh, experience uh, for, the, for the ninth graders. There's no greater indicator of success of having a great, uh, having a successful ninth grade year, and uh, that will set you up well for, for, for future uh, success at the high school. Just a reminder, there is a policy meeting on Friday, September 17th. The materials will go out uh, tomorrow. Oxridge has a Sunday fun day uh, up at Highland Farms. Uh, we'll get outside a little bit, enjoy some, some fun and games. And with that, that uh, concludes my announcements. And... I'll say this, um, we certainly welcome uh, sir, honest discussion and understanding of the, of the curriculum. But we certainly welcome that as a healthy endeavor. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Adley. Uh, moving forward, approval of minutes. Um, it is requested the board approve the following minutes. Minutes of the regular meeting held on August 24th, 2021. And I have a motion by Mrs. Ritchie, second by Mr. Moroni, all those in favor. That is unanimous. Thank you. Moving on to board committee reports. Any board committee reports? Mrs. Ackman? Sure. September 28th, um, we reviewed the close out of the end of the year, which I believe we'll hear about later. And Great. later this month, we will review um, from August 1st forward. Great. Thank you, Mrs. Ackman. Mrs. Stein, the policy committee meeting is Friday yeah, at 8.30, yep. just to confirm that with everyone. All right. The only thing I will um, add is um, we've got some Oxridge meetings this week um, that continues to move along um, on schedule and under budget. Um, we'll also be moving forward with uh, forming the building committee for the renovation of the Henley Homes and Royal Projects. So stay tuned for, for more good information around that. Um, the only other thing I'll add is I was invited and attended the CDSP meeting this past week. 
And I think Alan covered it, but I will just say a big thank you to them, but a big thank you to the parents at all these schools and the PTO organizations. The, the energy and what was done to kick off school around lunches and welcomes and stuff for kindergartens and new families, the, the energy was just incredible. So thank you. That's truly what makes these schools neighborhood schools and, and makes it a great community. So thank you for all of that. Um, we'll move along to presentations and discussions and uh, we'll get an update on the summer school and the ESY programs. And I will turn that over to, um, there's a whole bunch of people on here. <laughs> so yeah. uh, maybe I'll start with Mr. Tranberg or Mrs. Klein or whoever else is. Based, based on the presentation that's on the screen, I will gladly turn it over to Caitlin Stanton and Great. Mark Power who are joining us remotely. Thank you. Great, thank you. And at this time, what I'll do is I'll move to a screen share just so I can have my presentation. You're going to, who's that, Mark? Uh, yeah, Mark Power. Mark, you're going to have to try and speak up, Mark. All right. All right. If you can, Michelle, I don't know if we can enhance our communication here. That would be Jeff. Thank you. See what you can do, Mark. Thank you. There we go. And are you able to hear me better now? Sort of. Lean in. Yeah, better. Lean in and I think we'll go from there. <laughs> All right, I'll get as close as I can. Thank you, Mark. So good evening. Um, I'd like to start by thanking the Board of Education, Dr. Adley, and all the Darien Public School staff who helped make 2021 another successful year for Darien Summer School and Enrichment. Just to quickly review who we are, Darien Summer School and Enrichment is a comprehensive, diversified learner center program, which is available to all students, grades kindergarten through 12. While the majority of our students are from here in Darien, registration is open to all interested families. We typically draw from surrounding towns such as New Canaan, Greenwich, Wilton, as well as Westchester County. And this year, we had families register from as far north as Vermont, all the way down to Vero Beach, Florida. We have over 200 offerings, which include academic classes for credit, as well as enrichment. We've also expanded the amount of classes available by providing an option to sign up for some classes on a weekly basis, as opposed to requiring the full five weeks. Every year we aim to provide as wide a range of classes as possible. We are fortunate to have such a talented group of teachers here in Darien who are always coming up with new ideas for classes based on student interest. Here we have the classes that were new to our 2021 catalog. As you can see, this year's new classes include academics, the arts, mindfulness, and even a class on how to get rich quick on the stock market. Hello, everyone. This year, we started a new volunteer program in which Darien High School students were able to assist with various aspects of Darien Summer School and Enrichment, as well as the extended school year program. The idea for this program arose from the planning our administrative team engaged in throughout the school year, as we were unsure of what the COVID regulations would be during the summer, such as potential restrictions on visitors in the building, which would have meant that we would have needed additional staff. Interested students were asked to apply and interview, and after a rigorous process, 11 participants were chosen. Volunteers were asked to participate for at least three of the five weeks in order to allow for increased consistency for students. At the end of the summer, our volunteers reflected that they were grateful for the program and the learning experiences they had. Many of the participants entered the program aspiring to be educators in the future and had these goals confirmed after their experience with us this summer. Another opportunity we were able to provide to current Darien High School students, as well as our DHS alumni, arose through the Teen Teachers Program. This new program provided the ability for participants to share topics of interest with younger students. Those interested in the program were asked to submit an application detailing their proposed class or classes, and each applicant participated in an interview. Topics of classes range from coding to storytelling workshops, debate, neuroscience, and art. And for the classes that ran this summer, each teen teacher received guidance from a Darien Public Schools employee throughout the week of their class. 
Based on what the staff learned throughout the pandemic, we were able to offer fully in-person, hybrid, and remote classes this summer. After we surveyed the parents in the district, we found that a majority preferred fully in-person classes. So we did align our offerings for this summer accordingly. And while most of our students did participate in person, we had about 40 students who registered for the virtual learning options. So as you can see by this graph, we had a dip in the number of participants last year as we were fully remote, but we had a strong 2021 season with 1,565 students enrolled, which was our highest enrollment since Mark and I became involved in the program five years ago. Enrollments in active outdoor classes, such as football, field hockey, and track and fields were particularly high this year. And those 1,565 participants enrolled in a total of 2,589 courses this year, showing that many students registered for multiple classes. This year, Darien Summer School and Enrichment Programs generated a total of $694,979,000, which is a significant increase from last year's total of just over $120,000. It is our highest revenue in the past seven years. The discounts you see noted include scholarships and employee discounts. Each year we ask families to complete a short survey to gather feedback on their experience. Here you can see a sample of some of what was shared this year. Families really seem to enjoy our transition, academic, sports, arts, and theater programs. Looking forward to next year, we are planning to provide suggested class pairings, enhance communication through our website, which will allow parents to opt in for text messages in the event that we have to provide an emergency notification, such as a delayed opening or school cancellation. And as always, we will look to expand on the variety of classes offered. We also plan to continue to work towards our shift to the name Darien Summer School and Enrichment, which is more representative of our program offerings. Lastly, I'd like to give a special thanks to our Darien Summer School staff who braved the elements on July 9th, despite all the wind and rain brought by Tropical Storm Elsa. <laughs> they managed to make it to work to make sure our students wouldn't miss a day of fun activities and learning. And to close, we'd like to share a clip of the Summer Strings program performing Crocodile Rock at the Darien Public Library. <laughs> Mr. Power and Mrs. Stanton, thank you so much. Um, just awesome. Thanks for that update and thanks for all you did over the summer. It was an important summer and uh, thank the team from the board. Nice job. Thank you. Okay, we're also gonna get a quick update on the ESY programs for 2021. Caitlin and Mark, thanks again. I much appreciated all of your efforts, particularly during this COVID period. Thank you. Good evening. And Mark, thanks for mentioning that storm, because when you look at our first slide, you have our umbrellas behind there that we shared that morning. Um, that came in handy. Um, good evening to the board members and to the community, and thanks for the opportunity this evening. Um, we are excited to present our um, overview of the 2021 ESY program. In the spring, we had the opportunity to present to you our anticipated ESY program. We shared with you the ESY program overview and noted the considerations that we take at all our PPTs uh, and the criteria for making sure that we consider for all our eligible students. We look at non-regression, we look at regression, we look at recruitment, self-sufficiency and independence. We look at addressing and differing behaviors. And we also look at ability for students to be in an included environment. 
The one unique addition this year was we noted the importance of a criteria for recovery services. We began early on in our planning at our PPTs to make sure that we considered where our students were in response to the pandemic, what services were interrupted and planned accordingly. We added both in the budget and our grants recovery services that included consultant services, speech and language, OT, PT, and with your approval of psychologists at the high school and a special education teacher. With these additional resources, robust staffing, and a shared commitment to excellence in supporting our students, we realized an exemplary summer school program for our ESY students this year. I'd like to turn the presentation over to Kristen O'Reilly. For those families and students who participated in our program, Kristen was probably the first face they saw every morning at 7.30 there to greet all the students um, in supervision of the ESY program. Kristen O'Reilly is our elementary program director of special education here in Darien and is here this evening to present the update and outcomes of our ESY program. Great. Thanks Hi, so Kristen. much, Shirley. Thank you. Um, and, and just to add to Shirley's sentiments, I think um, just the fact that we were able to have our staff and students back in person with us this past summer was um, really just incredible. Everybody was so excited. So we were so grateful to have that opportunity. Um, in our uh, spring pre-program presentation, we provided you with a planning timeline uh, that sort of goes into our ESY 2021 program. That timeline highlights the year-long planning that goes into the preparation uh, for ESY each year. Here, we have a similar timeline uh, that captures what happens during the ESY program. So this uh, diagram should look a little familiar to you. The program began with an orientation and a move-in day for staff and providers on June 25th. On this day, teachers and related service providers organized their materials and classroom spaces for setup and preparation of student arrival on Monday, June 28th. Staff received important information regarding processes and procedures to include IEP acknowledgement forms, materials from sending providers, student IEPs and parent contact information, as well as safety procedures, attendance procedures, and progress report due dates. Students arrived for their services on June 28th, where they were welcomed by staff and providers. Communication with parents and students was ongoing through the months of June and July. Information regarding service delivery was more formally shared between providers and parents through the use of our ESY progress report, which was emailed home to parents following the completion of their child service on approximately July 30th. August 2nd marked the beginning of Bridge Week 1 with students remaining at DHS in Tokenique. For Bridge Week 2, beginning August 9th, staff from the high school moved over to Tokenique where all students received their Bridge Week 2 services. This graph, familiar from the spring pre-program presentation, outlines not only the ESY recommended student total, but also reflects the actual number of students who attended the program this year. Out of the 435 students recommended, we had a higher overall attendance this year at 361, which is 78 more students than in 2020 and 55 more students than in 2019. As discussed in, in the spring, PPT teams thoughtfully planned for student recovery services throughout the school year last year, some of which were delivered during our ESY 2021 program. The next two slides will look familiar to you. Um, these depict the number of certified and non-certified staff members for the 2021 ESY program. Um, these numbers did not change as we had staffing finalized by our, the time of our spring presentation. Um, so the values on both of these slides have not changed. This year, parents received the 2021 ESY survey on August 3rd through Aspen's messaging system. 122 parents responded to the survey and shared their feedback regarding ESY communication and logistics, as well as their experience with transportation. 87.9% of the respondents strongly agree or agreed with the effectiveness of ESY communication and logistics which included questions surrounding communication with families on student schedules, providers, room locations, et cetera. 
61.9% of parents who accessed ESY transportation this year, so a smaller group, coordinated by the district's transportation coordinator, strongly agreed, agreed, or were neutral toward the level of communication and support they received with regard to transportation during this year's program. Parents provided written feedback to include that the staff and teachers were wonderful, the school was easy to navigate, that they were happy with all the wonderful services their children received, that communication and logistics were properly administered, they appreciated the personal touches from both teachers as well as the executive staff via responsive emails and phone calls to address all concerns. I think in the interest of time, sure. this is incredible stuff. And again, thank you for all that we've done. I think everyone has gotten their board package and read through it. So if there's anything you wanna highlight or you wanna move over to kind of what you're thinking about for next year, I think sure. that would be great. Of course. So the parent and staff feedback, which you have in your packet, lead us to sort of this last um, final slide here, which is our outcomes and our goals uh, for uh, this upcoming ESY program. Uh, updates to the parent uh, and staff survey to include more clarity around services and dairy and summer school opportunities, as well as consistency and question categories to further support data comparison reporting for next year. Uh, another goal of ours is the implementation of a transportation app used to facilitate communication between parents and the transportation company surrounding pickup and drop off status. The implementation of the electronic reporting system consistent with DSS to organize student absences for communication with ESY staff. And lastly, uh, the implementation of an electronic system to maintain student and staff schedules including revisions and updates to facilitate communication among providers. Terrific. Thank you so much. We're happy Terrific. to answer any questions. No, thank you so much. Again, both presentations, incredible amount of information. And again, thank you for, you know, it has been a challenging year being able to do that for all our students. And I know my daughter participates in ESY and it's an incredible program. So thank you. I will, yes, Mrs. Klein. Thank you. May I just acknowledge um, Laura Straiton is here on the screen as well as Great. Scott McCarthy. I, all those, by the way, ELP programs that we had at Tokenique, just to acknowledge the success with that program. And for Dr. McCarthy, our secondary program at Middlesex and the high school as well. Terrific, thanks. I thank see you. them waving there. So thank you as <laughs> always. Thank so you. So we'll you. also at this time, open it up for any board questions or comments around these two great programs and the updates on those programs. Uh, Mrs. McCammon. Uh, just a quick comment that it's wonderful to see the program back in person. It is such an important part of our community. So that is something certainly to be celebrated. And thank you for all the work. This has been a lot of work over time, building a lot of different aspects of the program. Um, it's exciting to see that we're down to talking about absences. I think it's really important. Many of our students who have a lot of services have a lot of multiple touch points, and it's, it's very complex for students parents and staff to navigate when there are planned and unplanned absences. So I'm very grateful to see this coming up. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. McCannon. Mrs. Parent. Thank you. And thank you for all for the presentation. I think I will echo what Mrs. McCannon said that it's exciting to see the growth of this program and how success, successful it was this year. Um, quick question about the summer school with the volunteer program and the teen teachers. Is that something that you anticipate moving with forward? It seems very that people enjoyed that. Is that something that you would like to do moving forward? We certainly review all of our programming every single year and have discussions about what we would like to keep and what we would like to change. So that is the planning stage that we will engage in over the next uh, few months. Thank you. This is Richie. I just noticed on the survey that the transportation um, seemed like the maybe there's some issues going on there with the ESY program. So I'm just curious what exactly those issues were and how we're going to work to resolve and improve the satisfaction of our parents and participants and teachers, it looks like too. It was the first summer also we had new personnel on this end also working with Cape Barberry. So we did the runs together this summer. Um, in fact, what we found out that when we um, planned and what we can improve on is when we have some electronic access. Parents don't usually find out until two nights or the night before. Um, that goes the territory of bus transportation, as you know, but I think we can do better. 
make sure we have that. Some of the um, actually routes that were established could have been more efficient um, in terms of the number and the amount of time that kids were spending on the bus. So we think we can improve that as well. As well. So I think we can do it electronically. Um, Kate was wonderful to work with. I think she has some ideas in moving forward also. Um, and I think we'll just do better next year. Thank you. Can I add to that um, briefly too that, um, so the number of, uh, or the percentage that was reflected in what was reported out, um, it, let's say for example, so 122 parents responded to the overall to the survey, um, about 15 parents responded to the portion specific to transportation. So that percentage um, is a little skewed in a sense as well. We, we tried to um, capture it to the best of our ability and then also um, incorporate some uh, improvements to Shirley's point using the app for next year, I think will help further communication with families. Thank you. This is one more piece. I'm sorry, we'll have, okay. one, more, we'll have one more Suburban. Oh, if, it, if it shows up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Positive thing. This is awkward. Um, can I ask a little bit about ESY and especially because we had recovery services included where, and I know that plans are individualized, but did we see any trends of um, pockets of areas that were needed for recovery that we might anticipate? I know we now have grant money for recovery funds. So were there any big identifiable buckets that we should look to hear from a board that look, there are recovery services maybe indicating that this will be an area we need to strengthen this coming school year? <laughs> Feel free to add also. Um, I think related services, we saw that because I think we mentioned earlier we changed group size also because we went smaller in group size as well. So I think speech and language is an area that we're looking at um, that we had increased services. Um, I think OT and PT continue to kind of stay level, but we know that there were many new referrals that happened also. So as a result of the new referrals that we spoke about in the spring, we anticipate we'll need more related services and, and more instructional services. Thank um, you. We'll also know our new number for CDAF October 1 of where we are with our number of students and that will give us some broad understanding as well. Thank you. And I was going to add um, just uh, briefly to that as well. Um, I think when we were planning for uh, recovery services to happen over the summer, uh, oftentimes the conversation was around increasing frequency and duration. So that's sort of where we saw that play out over the summer. I was going to say related services too. So when we think about the things that were likely impacted perhaps the most in times when we were remote or hybrid, um, speech you know, being, being one of them and, and oftentimes our other related services, I find that that's where um, you know, many of our recovery efforts are sort of focused. focused on. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Great. Thank you very much for those presentations and for those updates. And thanks for all the hard work that was put in over the summer. We'll move on to the Darien Public Schools update, Dr. Adler. So I'll be quick about this. It's been a great start to the year. It has been a very healthy start to the year. That's a, that is the main picture here um, uh, from the COVID metrics. And we have had a, literally a couple of cases uh, each week. Thank you very much. We've had a couple of cases each week. Uh, this is the current uh, COVID tracking dashboard uh, that's updated uh, daily. So you can see we have uh, five cases at, at this point. For the students who have uh, been contact traced and had to quarantine, uh, none of those cases actually were transmitted in school. Uh, so those were outside of school. So uh, it has been, again, a, a very healthy uh, start to the school year. I think that's indicative of, honestly, the vaccination rate in this town is phenomenal. Uh, it's our, uh, our, young kid, our young people is, is over 90% and it may well be over 90% for the majority of, of the population. So that, that, that speaks volumes um, from that perspective. So uh, this no longer exists. So I didn't just want to drop it out, um, but the state has no, is no longer tracking it under this sort of uh, system as of just a couple of weeks ago. That was primarily for remote learning since they don't have remote learning uh, as an option. They're not really tracking it, so you won't see that again. You'll still continue to see uh, this graph and uh, the COVID metrics from the time, and you can see those, those are dropping significantly. I'll just go back to this page. Uh, the, mitigate, uh, the teaching, uh, the testing clinics, we were just surprised that um, 
We will be working with progressive diagnostics. I don't know about progressive diagnostics. I know Alicia's here, but that's a company that we have been uh, assigned to work with for the state. The state still does not know exactly the way they are going to run. We are going to have to be asking. They won't know and won't tell the parents how that's going to run until now we solicit from them how many actually are going to sign up to do the, the volunteer. So I apologize that this is a slow process, but uh, incrementally we get a bit, of, a bit of information. This was the latest information this week, actually. And uh, so we'll, we'll pass that information along about signups and we'll, we'll see where we go from there. Uh, uh, the medication strategies, we did go ahead and uh, split the, the middle school. Uh, we split the lunches uh, up, up into the small gym and that uh, seemed to have worked out uh, very well. And then I've just surprised you about the uh, American Rescue Act, uh, over $200,000 for uh, recovery services, 18 of which are, is for the uh, ELP. So we've opened in a healthy capacity. That is a very positive thing. I don't want us to forget that all our children are back in school. Things are going well from a health and safety uh, point of view. We'll continue to revise, monitor as we go. But that's, that's, the, that's, that's honestly the big picture in terms of it. It's, uh, it's a good, it is a good picture here actually uh, in Darien in terms of what has happened and uh, the, the, the programs we were able to provide the kids because we're in school. So that, that's, that's basically the summary for this. Thank you, Dr. Adley. I'll open it up to board questions or comments. This is Mr. Sini. Just, just so the idea grants, are they incremental to what's been budgeted thus far this year? They're, they are over and above uh, the, the original grant that we got, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sini. Anyone else? Good. All right. Thank you, Dr. Adley. Let's all try to continue to stay healthy. Mrs. McCammon. Um, in the finance committee meeting, you mentioned that might be a, a two-year grant. Is, is that, do we have any clarity on that? So we have to submit, I think, by November, and we still have, it, it, I think it's carryover, is it, Richard? I think it is. Uh, they, <clears throat> they haven't said yet, but it's, <clears throat> we're expecting it to be a two-year grant since the IDA grant is a two-year grant. Um, it is due in November, uh, but they have not specified uh, the year yet. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Rudolph. All right, moving along. Uh, discussion and possible action on procedures for conducting meetings on the Board of Education. So, uh, team this up, Dr. Adley. Uh, well, so uh, I just, we just want to put on the table of, of meetings going forward for uh, the board in terms of we are now in a sort of hybrid scenario where we have members of the community in front of us. Do we want to continue in this particular model? Do you want to go back into full in-person model or do you want to go completely uh, remote model? So that's the first sort of question format wise. And then uh, really the, the distinction, the, the question about how we respond to mass or no mass. So, we have our community members in front of us have mass. Uh, it's, it's, I think it's a question we need to just resolve as we sort of move forward type thing. Any of the models, by the way, for any of the models of a remote in-person or a hybrid are permittable through next, next, next April. Uh, we'll see what the governor does. There was discussion today about him continuing it, but we'll see what he does about the September 30, uh, whether we extend that beyond that in schools. But as for here, uh, the question for the board is really how we would like to proceed in terms of uh, mass wearing or not mass wearing in, in relation to the, the bigger picture and, uh, and what's permissible and what's not permissible uh, under the law. So uh, we have some options before us and I'll, be, I'll just put that question. Thank you, Dr. So just to recap too, in the document that we reviewed, that we are in line with how we can conduct meetings. That is correct, and yes. I think at this point in time, while I would love to have more people in person, we are doing what I think is the right thing from a spacing standpoint. I think we will, as a board, always look at and think about meetings. And if possible, we need to change a venue to accommodate more people. We will do that. It's difficult to do after a meeting has been warned. Um, I think right now, having the, the ability to have people come first come first service in person and then continuing with the Zoom um, allows many people to participate probably more than we could accommodate. So um, I'll, I'll start off with confirming that. Um, yes, and then I'll just open it up for board discussion. Thank you, Mrs. Ackman. I would just say, given that um, we have the option to either limit it to full in person, go full remote or do hybrid, hybrid seems to be working. It seems to allow people um, 
the chance to speak over Zoom. I think we've done it um, actually one of the best of any communities that have kind of struggled with how to do this through COVID. So at this point in time, I would, I would keep this model um, given that we're not going to be able to go back to um, the old model right. and have more more of the public in. Let's let people zoom in, speak their mind. Um, it seems to be working well. Yeah, I, I will just add to that the, the emails or the chain them on with other board chairs. Um, it continues to be a discussion and in some instances a challenge for them in terms of the structure of meetings, having the right technology, allowing people to zoom in you know, allowing to have the public comment. So um, again, we continue to be highlighted as a district that seems to be organized and doing the right things. So um, Dr. Ali, would you just confirm, I think it's important that we just have it all out on the table in terms of this building as an administrative building. And can you just kind of go over kind of the rules around that or the, the guidelines around that? Yes, um, if you're in a school building, you have to wear a mask. This is not a school building. And so, so if uh, in this building, if, you, if you're not, if you're vaccinated, no, vaccin uh, if you're vaccinated uh, and are, si are six foot apart, you don't have to wear your mask. If you're vaccinated and less than that, uh, you should be, should be wearing your mask still. And if you're uh, unvaccinated, you absolutely have to be wearing a mask. And if you're, you're vaccinated and want to wear a mask, you can. So depending on what the board does here too will uh, cause me for a bit of a reflection for consistency or otherwise, because uh, I think I think it gets hard for people to at times follow somebody's doing something and you're doing something else. So, so the overall guidance and what we discussed is for mask wearing. Um, as you can imagine, it's a, it's a lively group and everyone has their passions around masks. I would prefer not to wear a mask just in terms of clarity and hearing people speak. But I also feel we have to lead by example in terms of our students and our teachers and what we're asking them to do on a daily basis. So with that said, I'll open it up for further board mm -hmm. conversation and then we can go down the path of coming to a consensus. So Mr. Sini. I, I would just ask that we properly warn the next meeting so that we have members of the audience, our staff, ourselves uh, properly prepared. Um, and then, uh, Dr. Adley, maybe review your building standards so that there's some consistency um, with that policy. Um, I'm not telling you what how to handle that, but um, just so that there's no confusion on that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Steele. Any other further conversation? Comment? Mrs. McCammon. Um, I'm not sure. I don't know if Alicia's here tonight or, or Dr. Kennefeck. I'm not sure it would be effective, but one of the things that, that you know, has been talked about is the difficulty with masks is that it's, it's hard for us to hear one another sometimes, and it's hard for the audience or people on Zoom to hear us unless we're, you know, eating the microphone. Um, so I, I had asked the question again, I don't know whether it would be efficacious from a, uh, whether, but whether or not we should be pulling our masks down when we speak in honor of the fact that this particular board meeting has a, has a very specific role in communication with one another and with the public. Thank you, Mr. Cannon. I appreciate that. That has been brought up any number of times by board members and the public. So, you know, I'd appreciate a little conversation around that. Mr. Brown. Thank you. Um, just a point to make clear, uh, it was mentioned, you know, what our direction is. The direction for our students wearing masks is not coming from this board at this time. So I think that needs to be um, understood if we're going to be sending signals to people, letting you know where that guidance is coming from. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Yes. You know, as I mentioned at all board meetings and we've had that discussion, we are under a mask mandate by the governor. Um, that has been made perfectly clear. I do think, my opinion, that in order to support um, what the mandate that they are going through in the individual schools and the teachers, you know, I would support um, wearing masks. Mrs. Ackman. Um, so Mrs. McCammon's suggestion you know, I've thought about for as long as I've known about it, which is a little longer than this meeting. And I think it's a thoughtful suggestion um, and one that the board could certainly take up. But upon reflection, I think that if what we are being told is that our kids can learn effectively in school and communicate effectively in school with their teachers and can learn effectively in school with masks, which is currently what we are being told, um, then I think there's something to be said that we might as well live it and breathe it as a board, right? It might give us perspective 
it might help us understand both benefits and concerns. Um, but I, I, I think Mr. Deneen, you've said it eloquently. It also, you know, we're kind of in this together with our kids and our teachers. So um, I would be supportive of this time as long as a mask mandate remains in our schools that this group um, models the same behavior and kind of endures the same situation that both our teachers and kids do. Thank you, Mrs. Ackman. Mr. Brown, you demonstrated the model of perhaps removing your mask. So Am I thank you. To? Is that a no-no <laughs> yes. Um, Go for it. Yeah, no, I just would think that at this time, um, if we're going to be modeling behavior, we should model the importance of local control and adults making decisions for themselves. And I think that we have a top-down order coming from the government, uh, from the governor, excuse me. And I think it's important that we model that behavior that we would like to see in this town and the importance of that. And I think locally, since we're not required to, as this board, we should not be doing so in these meetings. And that's the message we should be sending. Okay, thank you, Mr. Brown. Any other comments? I just want to get consensus, or? Excuse me? Yes, do you want to get consensus and I can say my opinion, or you want to? I, no, go ahead. Okay, <laughs> I was, I'm going to share Mrs. Ackman's comments and that we are the leaders of this district and we need to be modeling um, what is, whether you agree with it or not, what is being, um, what is being told to our students and our, and our staff. Um, I also think that I have a child who's not young enough to be vaccinated. I am fully vaccinated. I still wear a mask when I go out with her, almost in, solidar in solidarity with her. And I think that's important. There is almost half of our population is not available to be vaccinated right now. So I am, I am in favor of us wearing masks, even though it's not necessarily the requirement for this building. Good. Thank you, Mrs. Ackman. Look, all incredibly valid Mrs. points. Parent. I'm Mrs. Parent. Mrs. Parent. Thank you. Mrs. Parent. I'll take credit. <laughs> She's blonde. <laughs> I'm not going there. <laughs> sort of. So, sort of. Yeah. so it's good we can all laugh. Um, look, all valid points. Mr. Brown, very valid point in terms of how we want to, you know, um, work with the district and work with our local health uh, department. So any other further comments or questions? Mrs. Ritchie. Um, so I agree local control is important. That's what we all want. But until our children are no longer required to wear masks in school, I am wearing a mask at every board meeting, regardless of what this board decides to do tonight. Thank you, Mrs. Ritchie. Yeah, can I just add yes, in? I also Zachman. think it's um, there's a local responsibility and um, we have a local responsibility to our children and teachers, I think, to... Um, to, to feel what they're feeling and do what they're doing. We're here doing work for schools. They're in schools doing work. And if that changes or it becomes a matter of personal preference, then I would support board members doing that. But, um, you know, we can find all the cute phrases for it, but this is the reality that our kids are living. Um, and communication is hard. And I imagine it's hard for little people with masks on as well. So um, maybe that helps give us some perspective as we choose to advocate down the line, just how difficult it might be. Thank you, Mrs. Ackman. Again, all good points. I would say um, we're, we're headed toward the end of the month. Um, let's hope or let's make our voices continue to be heard up at the state level for uh, some semblance of local control and working with our local health officials and having that um, choice and parental choice. Uh, but we are in that place right now where there is a mask mandate till the end of the month. So I appreciate the discussion. We'll move forward. Um, may I have a motion to approve the wearing of masks at Board of Education meetings by Board of Education members and members of the community. Mrs. Ritchie made a motion. Mrs. Ackman seconded it. All in favor? Sorry, I just have a procedural question. So then if we move forward with that, um, at what point should we agree as a board at what point are we going to, after September 30th, how would we go about returning to normal? Well, I think we can't do anything until we see what happens on September 30th. So right. if Maybe need be, weeks. call a special meeting or, um, okay. it's a great question. I just, okay. go Maybe ahead, Mrs. to Mrs. McCammon's point, at this point, we're saying that it's because it is a mandate, as you know, at, until it is the mandate is lifted mm -hmm. and then we could revisit yeah. the conversation if there's a local concern one way or a local free but i think mr mccann makes a good point we want to put an end date right. on this and it, if it's in if it's in following the mandate we probably we should model the language that so it puts an end date for us as so well. put an end date on it yeah 
Any yes, further board discussion on this? That's a motion to amend. Well, yeah. Go ahead, Mr. Senior. Right. Yes. Do we have to vote on this? I mean, if if we, we're warning the meetings with mask use, um, you know, I mean, aren't we do, then delving into a or delving into a policy discussion, which would need two weeks notice? And I, I think we can solidify this through consensus and then just warn the meetings. Do you, do you agree? I'm happy to do it from a consensus standpoint, um, and we continue to monitor the mandate and move forward. I think it's a flexibility. Right. If things change, we don't have to yeah. meet and vote right. to undo it. Okay. So just procedurally, we do have a motion on the table. We do. So, so we can just, just let, fail. Okay. let it fail. And then let it fail. All right. All those in, in favor? favor? No. So that motion fails. So we have a consensus of the board that will move forward with a board of ed members wearing masks and those in the community joining us. Looks like I have a consensus. Yes, Mr. Brown. We'll make it effective at the next meeting. We'll make it effective at the next meeting. All right, good, thank you for that question. All right, we're all in agreement, we'll move forward. All right, thank you all again for the, the, the conversation. Um, Maybe we get a consensus from the board that we're all in agreement that the current meeting format works. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, Mrs. Ritchie. All right, good, thank you. Again, thank you all for the conversation. All right, um, discussion and possible acceptance of contemplated gift for the music department. As always, we have an incredibly generous uh, community. So um, that is Dr. Adley and Ms. Thompson. I don't, I don't know if I see um, Colleen on there, do I? Yes, I'm here. Oh, sure, sure. you're in the dark, okay. I am. Uh, you're hi, everyone. You're in the dark, Colleen, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so I was approached by um, a resident of Darien named Natalie Venatos over the summer, and she offered uh, to donate an upright double base to the district. Uh, she brought it, uh, she had a neighbor bring it to the school and it looked like a very nice instrument. Uh, we had it appraised by Atelier Strings and uh, the value of the instrument with bow and cover has been appraised at $3,600. And uh, we would greatly benefit from the instrument as uh, it's difficult for students to transport large instruments to and from school. Um, we would uh, be very appreciative to have the instrument to use for any of our string bassists at uh, Darien High School or uh, Middlesex Middle School, depending on where the need lies. Thank you, Ms. Thompson. We appreciate that. And I will shout out uh, Natalie Benitos, a big thank you for your incredible generosity uh, for the incredible program that we do have around strings and music. So thank you very much. Um, any questions or thoughts? Terrific. May I have a motion to move forward uh, with acceptance of the gift for the music department? Uh, Mrs. Ritchie, uh, Mr. Maroney, all those in favor, that is unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you. Next conversation discussion on the fiscal 2021 year end financial report and fiscal 2021 expenses related to reopening and um, possible action on the return of unused funds to the town. Um, as Ms. Ackman mentioned, we did have a finance committee meeting. Um, so I will turn it over to Mr. Rudel to go over uh, the numbers. Uh, so we did end the year with a positive balance of 1.37 million or 1.31% of the appropriation plus the special appropriation. Uh, the general education RCs did end up with a positive 493,000, special education a positive 775,000, which is primarily excess cost and uh, special education transportation. And then reopening expenditures are a positive 100,000. We are recommending returning upon board approval the 1.37 million to the town's general fund. Uh, we did include a graph just to highlight where those big areas of uh, balances were. Um, 1.1 million of that 1.3 million was housed in the increase in excess cost reimbursement, salary savings, uh, primarily attributed to the resignation to uh, administrators, transportation, legal fees, and then the COVID um, RC. Um, in total, we did spend about $3.5 million to reopen schools. We got grants uh, totaling just under $1.1 million, and then the special appropriation of $1.78 million. <clears throat> um, the change from reopening expenditures from the May report uh, were pretty minimal. Uh, the largest areas were had uh, less substitute costs, uh, 
less LPN cost, and then less needs for contact tracing. So in total, it went from a positive 85 to 101. The overall forecast changed from about 1.25 million to 1.37. Uh, the biggest were special education transportation of 56,000, athletic transportation of 33,000, district legal fees of 17, and then some small salary savings, uh, police fire, and some small items um, as you see ahead. Uh, salaries were positive of the year by about 500,000. The biggest, again, were salary savings and substitutes at 327,000. Um, operating was positive by 541,000. Uh, you'll see the biggest uh, areas of savings were special education transportation at 235,000, legal fees at 149,000, and then uh, athletic transportation and sports officials at 33,000. Fixed expenses were a positive 39,000. Uh, the biggest area of savings was regular transportation, and that was due to the hybrid or remote schedules that we had during the year. Um, equipment was essentially flat at $297, and it was just a small amount of savings in technology equipment in the COVID RC. Uh, revenue was um, <clears throat> higher by 281,000. And again, that was primarily due to higher reimbursement rates for excess costs. Uh, we were less uh, in building rentals because we did not rent out our buildings. That was largely offset by increased uh, revenue from renting out our fields. Uh, there are no transfers uh, for approval to close out the year. Uh, we do want to note that the audit has already started and they're well underway. Uh, but as we said earlier, we are recommending returning that $1.37 million to the county. Thank you, Mr. Rudel. So um, I looked into this a little bit. There is um, kind of a history of votes and no votes on returning funds to the town. We don't do anything, it just happens automatically from an accounting perspective, how it works. So we don't necessarily have to vote on returning the funds to the town. Um, I think it would make sense to just have a consensus understanding that a financial report has been read to us. And thank you, Mr. Rudel, for all the detailed information and for the finance committee meeting as to um, that we ended the year with a positive balance of $1,370,630. Does that make sense for everyone at the board table? Mr. Chairman, could, yes, I'm just, just, yes, just for my clarification, when I asked last week or two weeks ago, uh, the board told me that you want to take a vote on this, but, but I'm just saying that why it was prepared that way. That's fine. But, but, um, sure, Paul. I'm recommending we don't take a vote on it and just move forward with a consensus understanding okay. of the numbers and how it works with the okay. town. Is that all right with everyone, Mr. Sini? Yeah, I was just going to ask procedurally if we said no, it would still go, right? I mean, so. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I think it's important that. We understand. There's a memo, there's a consensus. It was brought up at the finance committee meeting and there's an understanding of it. Is everyone in agreement with that? Um, there's, yes, a his, Mrs. there's a history of voting and part of that history of voting is so that the board affirms that it, this is the amount because it's actually the financial report is from the administration and the return of funds is from the board to the town. So I there's, a, there's a history of voting and not voting when we went back and looked at the votes over the course of five years, I think. So I don't disagree with you, but I just think on a go forward basis, I'm all right with the consensus unless someone objects to that. I guess. What's the issue with the vote? <laughs> I guess I'm just confused. It's a vote and we're all going to support it. We want to return the funds to the town. It, we could have been done the, with the vote at, at this point in time already. So I mean, we can do it either way. But I, I think procedurally, I think it also shows that the board supports the information and supports sending the funds back to the town. So I would prefer a vote, but I'll go with Mr. Brown. obviously. I'm just curious in the history. Um, and I'm not sure why, if it happens by operation law or whatever, uh, policy that's fine but what's the purpose of us voting on it we're giving an imprimatur as if we're an auditor or what what really is the history of that if anybody knows you think to the point of the previous conversation it's just an acknowledgement and an acceptance that here's where the board of ed ended here's what's going back to the town it so doesn't have anything to do with confirming or substantiating an so order no at its, at at an audit station or anything no, no okay. not at all not at all any further questions or comments? I have other questions. Sure. Yeah. Well, let's thank you, Mrs. Ritchie. Let's go back to, all right, let's pause a minute. We'll go back to any board questions around uh, the information that was presented. Um, and I'm sorry, Rich, that I didn't bring this up. Uh, it just popped in my head. But it, so the grants that we have depicted here are all, the monies are all received and these grants are closed out. Um, going forward, 
I would, I would hope that we continue to present because we still have ongoing grants. So I would just like to see this information continue to be presented in this format. I think it's very helpful. Yep. So we will continue the grant financial report every month uh, that we've been doing. Uh, and we'll report on the new grants, whether it's the AARP grant or the AARP IDA grant or any title grants or anything okay. else. And will we do the same thing for COVID expenses, whatever? We'll keep, if, continue if we have some that arise. Yeah. Thank you, Mrs. Ritchie. Any other further comments or questions? I would recommend we move forward with a consensus vote um, that we all understand and we've all looked at the information. Are we all okay with that? All right, okay. All right, thank you, Mr. Rudel. And um, thank you for all the hard work. Um, incredibly challenging year, but I think thanks to a lot of support um, from all the groups that support us and all the partners that we worked with, um, we got through the year. So thank you very much. Um, moving on, appropriation request for replacement of trucks. Um, so Mr. Rudel, I don't know, um, did you talk to Jen? This number has changed in terms of how the way the town wants to do this from a counting standpoint. So we'll get that in a minute, but do you just want to add some color around what we're asking for here in the line? Yeah, Mr. Lynch here too. Excuse me? Mr. Lynch just appeared. Mr. Lynch. Ah, Mr. Lynch is here. <laughs> Hi, Mr. Lynch. So, Mr. Lynch, tell us why you want some new trucks. <laughs> well, um, we had three trucks that got flooded out and ruined in July, with the original storm, and um, they uh, they had a value that was depreciated because of their years. One was a 2013, one was a 2011, and one was a 2017, and. Uh, there's a difference between what the insurance company is going to be giving us and what we've uh, we've been uh, we bid out the trucks to uh, gauge a cost on what they would be and the prices are good for 45 days so the bids we opened them on August 18 so we we have time and, and this seemed a good time to ask the board of ed for the difference between what our insurance company is giving us and what uh, what we need to purchase the equipment okay. to make us whole again. Thank you, Mr. Lynch. Um, I will give credit to Mr. Lynch and his team. They've been functioning uh, down three trucks um, and the maintenance team has stepped up in terms of getting done what we need to get done from a reopening standpoint. So they're truly working hard over there. I was actually over there the day after the storm. It was an incredible mess. Um, we also are going to have um, information coming back to us about potential loss of additional equipment from Ida also. So that is being worked on right now with the town and with Kerma and the insurance company. So um, the latest conversation I had with Town Hall and with the Board of Finances, they would like the request to come uh, for the appropriation for the gross amount of the trucks, which then gives you, Mr. Lynch, the ability to go out and purchase or bid or say you have the funds in hand. Um, so their recommendation is for an appropriation request to round it up to $150,000. Whatever the difference is of when you actually buy the trucks would just <laughs> not be spent or go back to the town in terms of the 150,000 versus the 147,862. Unless you feel that 147,862 is, is pretty clear. Um, it, it was, we did, it, we did a public bid and there were two separate vendors. Okay. And and their prices are good for 45 days. Okay. So that's fine. Then we can amend the motion for the 147,862. Um, I have also um, spoken to um, Seth Morton, Jack Davis, Clara T Clara San Santorelli, Santoro. Sorry. 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 It's hot in here. <laughs> um, and they're all aware the Board of Finance will figure out how they're gonna pay for this, um, but they've all been warned and they had their discussion at their rules committee that this is something that's coming from uh, the Board of Ed to them. It just also should be noted, there's just an incredible shortage and difficulty in procuring not just trucks, but any and all type of equipment and maintenance equipment, especially. So, um, so any other further questions or comments? Mrs. Ritchie. Just given the fact that we now lost three trucks and we're not going to be, be able to obtain new ones until January, what kind of position does that put us in in terms of um, facilities and maintenance? Are we able to use what we have and get by or is there some other temporary fix that we may need? No, we're, we're using what we have to get by. We had just purchased 
a new truck in the capital budget. We had not gotten rid of the old truck it was replacing. So that got put back in service. We have a truck we replaced a couple years ago. We sort of refurbished it and gave it to the IT department. We're gonna put that into service for, for plowing. And, and the foreman's truck, um, it's got a toolbox in the back. We're gonna take that out and put one of the sanders in there. That also is a spare plow truck. That's now gonna be a front line. Basically, we don't have a spare truck for plowing, but I do have a couple of vendors who have agreed to be able to step in on short notice and help us if we, you know, hit some breakdowns and stuff like that. But we have we have twelve people to plow and we have twelve plow trucks available. Thank you, Mr. Lynch. Thank you, Mr. Ritchie. Mr. Maroney, are any of these trucks in, uh, like, especially the twenty eleven? Would that be in the vehicle replacement program coming forward normally, or what is our how and, and and secondly, how is that going to affect the vehicle replacement program? Buying three vehicles in one year. It, it's going to skew the program out a little. Um, and, uh, you know, the 2011 was not due to be replaced for another four years. Uh, and the 2013 was going to be six years. And the, the 2017 is actually, uh, it, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's 10 years, 12 years left of abuse. Um, so yeah, there's going to be, there's going to be an issue. I think we're going to have to maybe stretch out some, some of these new acquisitions we're getting, they're going to have to last a year or two longer. So we, we get back, you know, I was trying to do something with one or two vehicles a year. We just bought one and now we got to buy three more. So, so some of them are going to, based on how they are wearing out in the next 10 to 15 years, we're going to have to see which ones can get stretched out longer to get us back in the yeah. same. Thank you, Mr. Lynch. Thank you, Mr. Maroney. Yeah. I've had that discussion with the Board of Finance. They're aware it changes the whole vehicle replacement schedule. They're not so concerned about it versus us having the right equipment that we need. So I think we're at a good place. Thank you, Mr. Lynch. Any other questions? Great. May I have a motion to approve a supplemental appropriation request from the Board of Finance in the amount of $147,862 to fund, uh, to replace the three tucks damaged in the town garage on Ledge Road by Storm Elsa. Uh, Mrs. Parent, second by Mrs. Ritchie, all those in favor, that is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, thanks, Mr. Lynch. Thanks, Mr. Lynch. All right, moving along. Um, Dr. Adley and Mr. Tranberg, discussion on curriculum uh, development and process. <clears throat> So I'm pleased uh, this evening, the board has actually identified uh, when we did the retreat, uh, could we do include uh, updates on curriculum and a curriculum review process. So that is somewhat coincidental, um, fortuitous or otherwise, but they align. And this gives us an opportunity actually in the first of the series, you will see in the, uh, the calendar uh, that the agenda item, uh, the, the last agenda item, that there are regular curriculum updates built into the process because that's what the board wanted. Uh, so that is in there. And this gives us, uh, gives uh, Mr. Tramberg an opportunity to share what's going on in curriculum. And, um, and we'll plan, there certainly will be opportunities to explore some of the, the issues that were on the table tonight a little bit. Uh, so that will be, I think that'll be helpful. And again, I, as I said earlier, we'd welcome the opportunity for an honest discourse about curriculum and uh, the process for it. So with that, um, I'll turn it over to Mr. Tramberg uh, for the first of a series of curriculum updates. Great, thank you, Dr. Adley. And uh, it's my pleasure to present on this topic tonight. As you know, as Su Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum and Instruction, it's definitely my area of passion and care. And I do appreciate the comments uh, that I heard this evening. Uh, so this is sort of a funnel type of presentation starting as large as possible with our vision, mission, and core values. Uh, I think it's important that we put them up there because we're hearing mission, vision, and core values and strategic plan used a lot uh, these days. And we have our vision statement, which is our aspirational statement of preparing all students today to thrive in a changing world tomorrow. And that's what we certainly aspire to do as we are developing curricula to challenge all students. Uh, the core values are just a reminder of the, the commitments we have as adults that we're going to make to realize our vision and mission across the district. I'm having the pleasure of uh, serving on the strategic planning committee, 
Uh, I was in goal area one. And I actually think that Mrs. McCammon and Mrs. Parent were in my goal area. Uh, and so I pulled out all of the, uh, the, the strategies that directly aligned to curriculum and instruction to help frame this evening a little bit. And being in that goal area one, I can say that we spent many hours crafted, picking every verb to be as, as precise as we possibly could to, to bring to the district what we thought it needed at that time. The first being to develop a shared vision of teaching and learning. Uh, that'll be the work of our professional development and evaluation committee, uh, fondly referred to as PDEC. Uh, and that work will happen this year. And these are intended to align that once we have defined what those are, um, we are going to use that information to inform the revision of our process. You might remember it also related to revising the template itself, and that's relevant later. And then making sure we're providing teachers with professional development that is going to support them uh, in delivering the curriculum that we have. Darian is known for having a responsive curriculum. So these are just some words, and I know you've seen these, this in the past. This is actually taken from a prior presentation on what it means for a curriculum to be responsive, uh, which might beg the question of, well, what does it mean when a curriculum is not responsive? Uh, so typically, uh, I shouldn't say typically, but traditionally, districts have a curriculum revision cycle. And responsive means that you're always responding to the changes in not necessarily real time, but on an annual basis. So you're looking at what is working, what is not working. And from that, you're not necessarily changing curriculum. You're making revisions to learning plans as to how students are going to access that information in the future. Generally speaking, we have three big drivers for curriculum and the strategic plan will be huge, standards and frameworks, and then our newly adopted vision of the graduate. And as I was looking at this, it also made me ask the question to myself, well, why does curriculum actually change? What is the cause of curriculum changing? And the first one is when the standards and frameworks actually change. That is, the, that is a driver that when that happens, we usually have federal and or state guidance that says you need to make changes in order to, to align with these standards. Um, as the governance of curriculum in the district, the board, when this happens, you usually see some type of a presentation that here are the new standards, and this is what we're going to do to align to those. One of the more recent, uh, as I was looking up, but there was a 2018, 2019 presentation on social studies. And that was when the shift went uh, from being, uh, to be more inquiry focused. And that's the result of the 2015 shift from the Connecticut social studies framework. So that's an idea of how that might work. Uh, another reason that we make shifts is if we see from how students are performing that it's necessary to make changes uh, into uh, what we're teaching and then what we know about teaching and learning changes. So that's the research that might guide the need for a curriculum change. The actual process, it starts with the development of a plan. So every spring I'll work with a curriculum leadership team and they'll identify these are the things that I think we need to change. And uh, we make sure that there's out there's resources to allocate that because those are finite resources. However, the board has been incredibly generous in supporting the curriculum revision process. Uh, and we have, the, we have adequate resources to do that on an annual basis. And from there, once the projects are approved and those are approved from my office, uh, if they need to make adjustments to units and they establish a curriculum team that's made up of teachers in those grade levels and or departments, then they revise the curriculum, they work with their uh, curriculum leader in that area and then those changes are communicated to any teachers that teach that curriculum and then we provide professional development or plan for professional development as needed so that's pretty much the annual cycle of how we approach um, these i wouldn't say curriculum changes just updates to curriculum and the teaching that supports it uh, we use curriculum very broadly so in education curriculum refers to the written curriculum the taught curriculum, and what for some time was called the uh, assessed curriculum is now often referred to as the learned curriculum uh, in, instead of the assessed curriculum. And the curriculum itself, the written part of it, has three stages in an understanding by design framework. So the third stage is the assessment. In the middle is the learning plan, how teachers get there. And the first part is, well, what is this all about? What are we actually learning in this unit of study? 
what are the standards, what are the essential questions, what are the understandings we want students to have. Uh, and that is the part that really gives an overview of, of what a, a, a particular unit is all about. To support a unit of study, we have uh, these instructional resources. And not to be complicated and confusing, but instructional resources have two lanes. There's some formal instructional resources. And so a formal instructional resource might be a textbook that is used for the course. Um, it might be our uh, teacher's college reading and writing units that support elementary literacy, elementary writing. It could be our math and focus books. Those are all uh, primary instructional resources. And when I say they're primary, that means they're guaranteed. So no matter who is teaching the class, the students are going to see um, those resources as part of the study. Teachers also have the professional responsibility and they use their professional judgment to have these secondary resources. There are things that they think could help teach the unit, could help move it along and make the lesson stronger. We do support some of those through technology uh, like Newzella, uh, Discovery Education, and many other platforms where teachers can go. Um, they're vetted, <coughs> they're vetted uh, resources and teachers can pick material, but things as simple or complicated, depending how you look at it, like a newspaper, a news clip, uh, any media story, those are all things that might be used as a resource on, on any day. So in light of the board's request to hear more about the curriculum process this year. Um, I've been reflecting on what are some things we want to do to really address the questions that you've asked me in my year and a half that I've been here so far. And uh, one piece that has been uh, pretty clear to me is the desire for transparency. Um, I share that because I can tell you that curriculum work is not a secret. We certainly want transparent curriculum. We do have a website that has the information there, but I think that we can be more consistent in what that looks like. So if you're looking at a content area, it might not look so different. If you're looking at different grade levels, it might not look so different. That's, that's one piece right off the bat. And one way to do that is um, having some curriculum warehousing, uh, whether it's through software or just a more common approach of what does it look like? How do we describe what students are experiencing? Making sure that that consistency is there across the board. Um, other ways that you have already supported uh, curriculum is annually approving new courses, which we have adjusted that timeline so that gets to you in a more timely process that's more aligned with the budget. Um, I would like to share with you when I'm making the decision of the proposed updates, what are, what are the things that we're thinking about adjusting and changing uh, on an annual basis and uh, the professional development that we are using to support teachers in that as well. Uh, so another presentation that I would anticipate in the curriculum updates this year is we do know that Teachers College is going to have a significant change to their resources. And so since that is such a huge part of our reading and writing program, that would be a time when there'd be a board presentation and we would want to make sure that the support and governance is there because that would actually warrant a curriculum change not just an update to the curriculum itself. And I said a lot quickly, um, but I'm glad to have this discussion. Dr. <clears throat> excuse me, anything you wanna add? Before we open up to board questions or we can do that and then- Well, we can certainly open up the board questions. Um, the um, cornerstone of, of this district has been two things that I, through my entry plan, and I've reiterated in many different places, the guaranteed viable rigorous curriculum that is provided and through the delivery of, of the staff members, right? The talent, the staff that we have. We absolutely depend on as part of the process, the selection, the professional academic and expertise of the staff to allow them to select some of these resources to support the actual curriculum itself. That is an, an intricate part uh, of the process that we have depended on. I can say that uh, because anywhere you go, you, you're dependent on that. And uh, the staff in this district has proven itself over many, many years, right? Um, that uh, they are talented in that area, they know what they're doing. It's not a mutually exclusive process though that well, everybody just does anything they want. 
I mean, that's not, that, that just doesn't work out like that. I actually, I just want to reiterate the idea for the parents and so on who came this evening. I do think it's a healthy thing to have an honest dialogue about curriculum. I don't think it's a healthy dialogue or a healthy thing to have that misrepresented in any way. I will say we have, I really haven't had too many discussions about critical race theory. We don't teach critical race theory. And I would hope that we would, if we enter into a discussion about curriculum, about learning what it is, how does it work? How do you, how do you know about it? That we don't drag these other things into it. And that we look at the issues as they stand. In this case, it was uh, in the most recent case, it was a social studies class. And I would ask people, uh, and I think that that is what is happening. And I would ask us to continue in that, in that vein. So let's keep it within the context of, of the, the matters on the table. And that's, let's not draw all these other things into it. Um, certainly, if we have to talk about those, we will. But I would, I would ask for that honest sort of reflection and dialogue. And certainly, we are open and welcome uh, to that. So I'll frame it just like that. And I will just re uh, reiterate that the chain of command, command, which is on the website, clearly delineates where people go for uh, questions pertaining to curriculum or instruction or any other matters uh, for that matter. That's not to say. To anybody in particular, you didn't follow it. I'm just pointing it out that it's there. So I'll leave those comments and open up to the board for questions if you have. Thank you, Dr. Adley. Um, Mrs. McCammon. I have a couple of questions, but picking up directly on where you are uh, speaking, Dr. Adley, um, we've had a couple of times in my uh, tenure on the board where teaching materials have uh, reached a level of resonance in the community. Uh, there was several years ago, we had a parent bring forward, I think in the year before you were here, a parent bring forward some materials that came from, a, I believe a pro-Palestinian uh, group um, that we had a parent uh, uh, bring to our attention or bring to the attention of both the board and, and administration. Uh, I think it was two years ago, there was a display in the library that the Black Student Union uh, raised some concerns about so what I would like to know is when we do have a piece of curricular material that hits a, a chord with the community, what is your, assuming the community follows the chain of command appropriately, what is your internal process for taking a look at uh, a piece of material? So I'll turn it to Chris in a second, but fundamentally, I'd be asking people to, to work through that particular process, first of all, which is with the teacher, Generally speaking, thereafter it's with the department head, and thereafter that is it's it's, it's with uh, the principal. And I know that seems like you're giving everybody hurdles to to jump over. Well, we're not trying to do that, and hopefully through through the process there comes to an understanding, both from perhaps the community member side and perhaps even our uh, uh, our employee side. But building on that, yes, but. Um, so that's that's a little bit the interaction between the community yeah. and and your staff. What is your staff process for taking a look at a piece of material? How how do you right. all evaluate so it? So I'll let Chris talk about the department process for actually doing that. So when when teachers are creating courses and materials, there's often a shared bank of materials that they would use and go to, and they vet that with each other. If there's a question about a particular uh, resource, they might go to their department chair, they might go to me to take a look at that. However, every item that a teacher uses, every video clip, every article, that's not necessarily something that's going through a process to say, yes, this has a stamp and everyone says this is okay to use. That's just, I don't think it's possible, first of all, because there's almost an infinite, there's, there's thousands and hundreds of thousands of resources. But when it comes to what we have in our documents, and what I referred to as those, those primary instructional resources, those are things that are vetted together as teams and that they share. If there's something that someone finds problematic, I, it's what Dr. Adley said, that when you can start with the teacher with the conversation, they're the closest to it and able to establish the context with immediacy. When it comes somewhere else along the chain of communication, it often is literally going backwards in the chain of communication for the person that, that you spoke with to, to do that exact thing. Go ahead, Mrs. McCann. So just, but to clarify, when you're actually reviewing a piece of material that's been brought to your attention, whoever that for reveal you is, what is the framework you're using? How do you, how do you evaluate something that 
wh whether it's you know how a display is constructed or it's it's a graph. You know, again, I appreciate the the discussion about sort of what the interaction looks like. But what I love to understand is when you're asked to evaluate a piece of material, what do you do? The first thing that I would do is look at the standard slash framework that goes with that unit of study. And then the next question I would have is if you need to use this instructional resource, um, what are the, what's the activity that students are going to do with it? And ultimately, how will this support their learning at the end of not necessarily the unit, but it could be a lesson. And it often is. It's it's not part of a larger unit when something's questionable. It often is this item, this, this one thing that was shared. Um, so that's how I would frame it with the question with the teacher. And it's, it's not something I would do independently either. I would rely on a team to take a look and and vet it. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. McKenna. We, we do have department chairs for that, Mr. McKenna, for that very reason. And as part of a team and stuff, it's not unusual that we would sit down and have that, have, have that uh, discussion with those teams. That's the re Listen, these people are smart people, right? That's why you've hired them. That's why we have hired them. And uh, uh, I'm confident that collectively people will come to the right decision uh, when we have we have discussion before ourselves. Thank you, Dr. Early. Um, Mr. Chamber, could I throw a question out there that's come up? And could you just give a little kind of insight as to textbooks, no textbooks? We've invested heavily in the districting technology um, most people read on Kindles or read on their iPads. I'm sure the traditional textbook can be on our technology. So I think we should be clear in when we say we're using a textbook, whether it's hardcover or it's now on the technology, I think we need some clarity around that. Um, so it, textbooks very much depend on the content area. So textbooks, things to, and these are general statements about textbooks, not, I'm not trying to attack any textbook, but textbooks are written by publishers. Publishers are trying to sell textbooks and 20 states in the United States adopt textbooks by the state. And in, I would say the most competitive performing states in our nation, they're not textbook adopt, adopting states. They're appealing to the largest amount of people that might buy it. And those, the states are Texas, Florida, and California are the largest uh, states that have a textbook adoption by state. So it, that's a, it's a business and publishing is a business. So that's, that's just food for thought about textbooks. Um, the other piece about textbooks is they're not primary sources. So in 2009, when the common core standards came about and ultimately the state core standards, um, we're supposed to be using primary sources and textbooks are often not even written by people that are scholars and in that content area, they're people that write textbooks. Uh, so that's why they can be problematic uh, for sure. Um, when a textbook does the job and serves the curriculum and aligns to the standards appropriately, and there are times that it does. Uh, so for us, um, like ancient civilizations, we have a textbook that's still in use for that class also because ancient civilizations doesn't change so much. Um, but, our, but our history book, like our, our US history book's 20 years old. And so it, you might say, well, why don't you just ask for a new history book then? Um, part of it was for many years, we couldn't get past the Vietnam War. And that's not an epidemic in Darien. It's, there's lots of US history and the framework says, this is where you should start. And you just can never get to this spot. And at the same time, the framework is saying, how does all of this relate to right now and today? Um, so the shifts that we're making are not changes to curriculum, but how can we make some shifts to get to the things that are already in this framework that the board has supported and then work backwards to make it all make sense? Like I bird walked that a little bit and I'm not intending to. No, I appreciate that. that you know, there's comments we've eliminated or we're not using a textbook. And I think we need to be clear to your point of either age of textbooks, the fact that they stop at the Vietnam War and we have to supplement what happened between now and then. So I, I think that's important information for everyone to understand. Yes, and just to be clear, our textbook didn't stop at the Vietnam War. The curriculum was so dense, we couldn't get past it. But for example, 9-11 would not have been in our US history textbook. And I would say that if you're in a US history course, that's something that's critical that we would wanna to get to over uh, the course of, over, over the course, over the year. Thank you, Mr. Trainberg. Mrs. Parent. Thank you. Um, thank you for explaining 
you know, in layman's terms, how curriculum gets created. Um, I have a couple of questions. My first is, can you talk a little bit about teacher autonomy um, and how the district deals with that? How much leeway teachers have within the curriculum or with when they're delivering curriculum? Um, and just, I'll just leave it like that. So I, I'm speaking on behalf of the many teachers that I've spoken with. I, I would say most teachers would like more autonomy most of the time. So the the way that that has been, I'll call it negotiated over time, is how we really develop that first stage of learning, that what are the guaranteed experiences, what's the knowledge and skills um, that need to come from this unit, and then also how will students be assessed, I would say are the two places that we want to be as common and as tight as possible. And autonomy comes as, well, what does the teacher bring to the thinking and the teaching and learning along the way? That's what we call stage two, um, where they can bring their own um, I'll call it the art of teaching, and we really rely on those the, the other pieces around it to be the science of teaching of what are those clear standards and frameworks and how do we know that students have learned that. So the autonomy lies in the middle. Um, and I, yeah, I think that's a that's an accurate description for most teachers in the classroom. Thank you, Mrs. Parent. Mrs. Stein. My mic back. Um, Hi, Chris. Uh, you touched on it a little in your presentation, but I think it's important for the public to have a clear understanding. Can you talk about the board's role in curriculum development? So I would say the first big piece in that is adopting whatever the standards and framework are that are going to support a particular uh, course. So I'm sure there were many presentations that went in 2009, 2010, 11, as the core standards were adopted. 2015 on, you probably lived in social studies. Um, so that's the, the big one when there's those big changes. The other is if there is a large scale change in a primary instructional resource. So I would guess, I wasn't here about math and focus. There's no way math and focus happened without the board having presentations on math and focus. TC units will not change without the board saying, this is these are the new units, this is how they're different. So that would be the next, the next level. And then the third is, when there are updates, and I'll say changes of significance, and I, I do want to be clear that there have not been changes to curriculum that are dramatic changes. Um, I arrived on March 30th, I believe, of the shutdown, and we've been living in a pandemic ever since. It hasn't been time to make a dramatic shift in what our curriculum is. And I, I do think that that is necessary to, to state. There's, there's no sudden change. Thank you, Mr. Tramberg. Uh, Mr. Brown. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate it. So, I'm just reading from the statute here. Um, there's a school the school board. It says each level of regional board of education shall establish a school district curriculum. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Chris. Let me just read from this. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Brown. It says that each local and regional board of education shall establish a school district curriculum. The committee shall recommend, develop, review, and approve all curriculum of the local or regional school district. So when I read all, and I hear we just see major, could you explain that disconnect? Yes. So a lot of it's in the how you're defining what curriculum is. And the way that curriculum is defined, and it's a shared adoption of the term, is what are the standards? knowledge, skills uh, of a unit of study that uh, exists for any given course, grade level. And that's the part that has come to the board. So when we are making, I will call them updates to the, let's see, it's, it's complicated because we call everything curriculum and everything's not necessarily curriculum. So when we're making updates to how we are delivering that stage one, those agreements that the board has supported, that's not a change that would, in my opinion, impact governance of, of the board. Got it. Um, I mean, I could see where you would read this and see all and think that means everything that we should do. And I know a number of other boards of education do have standing boards of you know, curriculum committees that meet where they source that out to a special subcommittee or there's different formal things. I know we've always operated on sort of the board of all or the committee of all, um, but 
you know, I'm just, that to me as a board member, tr board member troubles me that we haven't had that committee standing is part of something we do here and that this has gone on for a long time without an adoption of that committee. And, and I do read this, it says shall and it says all. And so that's something that concerns me as a board member that perhaps we can consider over time uh, what our process is working with the admin. The other thought I would have is um, when you talked about the teachers and we're going to that second level and we're deferring to their professional judgment and they have autonomy and of course they always want more autonomy. Is there training that takes place around how that process happens and how they learn to maneuver in that autonomous space or in terms of their lesson plan development? So I, I would argue that most professional development is about that stage too. You're, we're always training teachers on um, what is going to directly impact their instruction. At least that's the aim because when professional development is valued most by teachers, it's related to what we're actually asking that they do in the classroom. Got it. So do we, do we put guardrails or scopes or definitions around what's permissible and what's not. And again, more specifically, do we have training that we provide to the teachers about how they should do the development? Um, I would say that the, the best guardrails are there are ethical guidelines for teachers, and we certainly consider those to be the guardrails. And the, the standards and frameworks are, are complex and not exciting to read, but it's important to, to look at them, they're big. And we, we work with teachers and each other on interpreting them to make sure that we're doing justice to, to bringing those to life for students and preparing them, which Darian has done incredibly well. Obviously. Is that information public or could it be made public? Um, so when I hear you asking that, I'm hearing could the tens of hundreds of thousands of documents that might appear in a classroom be made available? So I'm really talking about the teaching component that we provide the professional development to our teachers. Yeah, so I'm, that, around, I'm really around that. I'm not looking for all the material. Yep, so I could, um, because I have, I have heard you with the, the curriculum committee request. Um, and so what I, the design of this year and bringing in those presentations that are more intentional and thinking of your responsibility as the committee of the whole, I want to intentionally say, this is when we're doing that. And when those are happening, that's when that is. And I, I haven't I had, the, had COVID, so it's been a strange frame. Yes, I just I haven't it. had the chance to do that with you yet. Right. And I would hope to have that chance before we say then this isn't working. Let's do this. Instead. No, I'm fully aware, and I appreciate all your efforts throughout the pandemic. So please don't don't think I don't have that factored in. Um, the last question I would have is since we're a public institution, obviously whatever messaging we're sending has to be non-political. We have to have anything that's disseminated from us as a government entity has to be free of viewpoint discrimination, either coerced communications or you know, uh, silencing ideas. Do we have training that happens around that to teachers as to what their legal obligations are in that, uh, in that realm as a public educator? Um, spe that specific, I would say since I, during my tenure, no, and I'd also say not yet. It's certainly something that we need to do. And it's not completely unrelated to um, all of the challenges we're facing right now with, I'll say other issues for now, and it's, I wouldn't disconnect it completely from DEI. Um, we're always looking for what our teachers need. And when we have like specific situations like the ones happening now, our teachers might ask for, for more support in that area as well, and we'd respond. Yeah, I wasn't asking you to put on a lawyer hat as well. I think you get enough, <laughs> but um, I just, you know, that is something that could lead the district to liability. If we do have errors there, we start promoting a certain ideology. As it's, there's no. So I, I just would like to make sure if there's training available there, we can see it great. If it doesn't exist, that's something I think we need to make sure. And again, I don't mean to attach you with the legal stuff and we have to get counsel. No, I would say the sure way that it, it is important to know that while we're not, we're not talking about political ideologies and teaching a political ideology that's desirable, embedded in the standards in many courses at a pretty young age is understanding the political landscape and the, the continuous obligation of civic engagement for students. Because when they are 18, which most of them are when they are in high school, they are going to register to vote and they may choose a political party affiliation. And it is important to know that as a result of social studies, um, those are the things that you encounter and try to understand to, to have an idea of what the local landscape is, the, the greater and the global. But it's important for all of us to remember here at the board and of course the admin that this is a public institution, this is government funded. And so we have greater and different obligations than just the general community. So I certainly make sure that's under consideration as part of 
as we figure out autonomy and look at how we're going to, you know, set the guardrails. That's something that's part of the framework we use to teach and teach in terms of professional. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chamber. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Mrs. Ackman. So, I mean, I think Mr. Brown is correct. The government is control in control of a lot of this and set standards, but I also think we need to understand that our teachers have master's degrees, many of them. And, and that is training in itself. It's not a master's degree in like how to play with kids. It's a master's degree in education. So it's like being a lawyer. You go for professional development throughout your career and annual professional development, but you were trained to be an attorney. The people we are hiring and, and our rigorous thing is we're hiring the best teachers, right? So, so there, we're hiring people oftentimes with a master's degree or the very high degree um, in education. So these, these, these employees, these are, are, are men and women who come to teach, come knowing what they're doing, knowing their obligations, knowing what it is to teach in a public school. They take standards and, and tests in order to get licensed to do that. So I think that the district professional development is always helpful, but just like it is for doctors and lawyers, these are professionals we're dealing with. And, and I don't want that to get lost. I heard a lot from both sides of this debate, a lot of respect for the expertise of our teachers. And I appreciated that. However, people felt that they, they acknowledge that our teachers are professionals and come with a high degree of training. Um, on the curriculum committee, we, we, we can, the board can choose to reinstate one or not. It was a, a, a very um, informative discussion because New Canaan was having a similar type debate about whether to have a committee or a committee as a whole. We invited in lots of people to talk about it. Um, it was even before I was on the board, maybe the year before I came on the board that it was disbanded. Um, and it was disbanded, but we were in compliance with state statute because we were all reviewing um, curriculum. And outside of a year of COVID, which I think there, Mrs. Stein and I were requesting during the retreat, we'd like to see more curriculum because COVID kind of, you know, didn't allow for that. We had pressing immediate issues. It was a little bit of a triage year. Um, we have seen it. We have seen changes in, changes in teachers' college. We have seen units of study, seen um, change in history and kind of all those timelines you just laid out um, or when we really saw it, we just saw the new science standards a few years back and how that was going to affect our curriculum. So. I think the board does a good job. There are lots of ways to do it and a curriculum committee might now be the best way. We choose to do it. Um, but I think this board has done a good job. I think what I'm hearing um, is that there are some concerns over the resources that were used in a class. And um, I think it is really important and maybe this is why this discussion is so important tonight to understand the frameworks. The frameworks are available to review, political landscape, civics. This board talked a lot um, my last year as chair about civics and the importance of civics and was civics still in the classroom? Well, civics involves looking at types of governmental engagement, political engagement. So I think we can't talk out of both sides of our mouths. We have to be really clear, but resources are in the, in the hands of teachers, department chairs, principals, and our assistant superintendent of curriculum and instruction those questions are best served by going through what we have is called the chain of communication, not command. And I think sometimes people might feel put off by saying, go to the department head. But the answer is the department head has worked with the resources and can give you the best answers is always been my understanding and my experience. So maybe what would really help people who are concerned is to understand when we say, go talk to a department head or a teacher that we're doing that because those people are making those decisions and can best inform you. And then if you still have a concern, escalate it. Um, but I feel like somehow this one got out of line um, or out of line is the wrong term. I don't mean that out of scope. And it's, it took off like wildfire on social media and we have to find a better way um, to let people know that the people we're directing to them can give them the answers. They can choose whether they're satisfied with those answers or not. But it's not because no one wants to talk to them. It's because they are, we're giving them the person best equipped to answer them. And, and I do feel like this is where we got far off field on this one um, and probably created stress no matter where you felt on the debate over the resources. Thank you, Mrs. Ackman. Mr. Maroney. 
Yeah, so I have a question on the resources. So I'm a little, if you could educate me on the, the secondary resources selected by the teachers and, and the shared bank that you were talking about. So how does something go from a, a, a teacher selected resource into the shared bank? Does it, is that when something succeeds in a the classroom, they share it? Or if something falls flat, do they share? Or, do, or is it all, everything is shared? And, and how is that determined as to what goes into the shared bank and, and how that is then, does that then become a primary resource over time? And I'm just trying to understand the fluidity of that. I would say there's no formal process of who uses a shared bank, who doesn't use a shared bank. Um, I will say that to formalize it, that's, that's why I'm, I'm proposing that we approach how we warehouse our curriculum a bit differently for that reason. So we could know clearly what are the guaranteed resources everyone's going to use and what are, are not. It's really relying on, we have a, a culture of PLC and that's the professional learning community. And that's the teachers working together as professionals and they share resources. Um, and a team of three people, two of them might use it, one might not. It doesn't make a resource bad or good, but in, the, in relation to teacher autonomy, a teacher can connect to that piece and, and, and bring it to life in a way that another one might feel like they can't. So it's not, it is relatively fluid when it comes to um, which resource am I going to use. Thank you, Mr. Maroney. Mr. Sini. So, uh, you know, might I suggest that we, we're not going to solve anything here uh, tonight, uh, you know, regarding a curriculum committee, but I would ask that um, the chair consider uh, adding an agenda item in a future meeting to discuss a curriculum committee. The reason why I think it's important, especially at this time, uh, there's admittedly a void created by COVID. Um, and I think, you know, a, a focus of, uh, you know, a, a subset of our, our group might might be good to work with the administration, better understand. Um, you know, I deeply appreciate all the comments we heard this evening, but it's clear that we didn't have the answers as Board of Education members, not only specifically on the issue, which I don't think we should, but on, on curriculum in, in general, I think that'd be helpful to create the uh, knowledge base for the board. Just on professional development, I mean, we're all, I'm a professional, I go through it every year. I think it's important that, again, we learn as a board what the professional development is. I, again, I give utmost um, you know, credit to the teachers. They are professionals. They, I definitely don't wanna be micromanaging curriculum. That's not my role here, but I do think it overview and ensuring that the values that our community desires in our education system are met and the standards of the state are met um, and the ability to communicate and, and create the transparency that I think we've heard a number of times. Um, just one last question. I think, you know, again, we, we talked about content a lot, but the implementation of that content, I think was one of the big issues that came up and admittedly, I think the administration said there might've been a mistake in how uh, this instance was implemented. So maybe we can, you can talk about how, how that is governed or, or uh, looked over by the administration and, and how those implementation of curriculum might be, be corrected and, and uh, refined. Well, I, I won't speak specifically to this incident because I'm not sure that would be appropriate, but I'll speak in general about how there's oversight of curriculum implementation and that's through the teacher evaluation plan. So this year it's a, we're in a, a little bit of a different year because all teachers are um, evaluated. If they've been in the district, they have two informal observations. That means they are seen twice by an administrator, um, often by one building administrator, and then whoever the curriculum specialist is in that area. And then they have a professional review of practice. Uh, and so that's where they would receive specific feedback related to performance. It's not uncommon to get regular feedback from administrators on a regular basis. Um, the, I will say the teacher evaluation system in general, once again, is under uh, a pretty big overhaul. The state's partnered with Learning Forward, and I would expect to see um, a proposed change to that, which would be another uh, whole board presentation that we would do in the spring related to, uh, I would say, connected to curriculum oversight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sini. Good points. I appreciate that. Um, Mrs. Parent. Thank you. I just want to echo a little bit of what Mr. Sini said and also Mrs. Mrs. Aquin said, our teachers are professionals. Um, I have a master's degree in curriculum, so this is my this is near and dear to me. These people are trained to identify sources and resources, and I are trained to implement them the best that they can. 
Um, teachers are human, teachers make mistakes. That's why we have administrators. That's why we have people to oversee how they are doing their jobs. Um, if there is a breakdown somewhere, that's where the chain of communication comes in. And if I, I just, I can't emphasize this enough. If you have an issue with your child or a classroom, go to the classroom teacher first. They are the ones with the direct knowledge of what is happening. Um, my other is a little bit of a tangent. Um, we talked a little bit, of, we talked a lot about the teacher's roles, the administrator's roles in curriculum. We talked about the board's role in curriculum. Can you speak to the parent's role in curriculum? Is there a role for parents in curriculum and developing curriculum? I would I would say formally no. The the board has the board is the elected group of people that represent the parents in the community, provide the governance over the curriculum. Um, when we receive feedback, which we do in, in lots of different ways. So every time that there's a survey, when parents are in buildings and letting us know how things are going, that's and those are all informal ways. But as far as a formal process, I unless I'm missing something obvious, I would say I don't I don't see that. Thank you. And also, you. because we're obligated by the standards right. and the frameworks, that's 100%. that's what we have to teach. That's the requirement. Thank you, Mrs. Perry. Mrs. Ackman. So I just want to keep the board in a good space. And we're I keep hearing the word mistake. To be clear, yes. the board has not been briefed on any incidents of a classroom situation because the board doesn't deal with, with situations with individual children. Um, I did hear some comments like, well, why don't we hear what happens to a teacher? People should know, unless a teacher goes through a for very formalized process, teacher complaints don't come to the board. So I don't know that the board has heard that there was a mistake or not a mistake. What we have heard from the public was there was a concern about how curriculum is reviewed. Um, I just wanna make sure that we're not commenting on what happened in a classroom or didn't, because I haven't heard the administration say that, nor have we been briefed on that. We did hear the concern on curriculum, we had been asking about it over the summer. I, I appreciate you having it ready because it looks like we really needed it. Um, and, and some board members really want to, to learn more if they haven't yet about how curriculum's approved. So this is great. I look forward. I think what you're saying is that curriculum is coming, but I just don't want it to sound like we're opining on any one incident because at least I, as a board member, have not been briefed on a specific incident. Thank you, Mrs. Ackman. Any other further report? Mrs. Ritchie. Um, it's just really a thought that's in my mind right now, just how, how we can work better with our, our parents, I guess, to communicate to them curriculum and standards. And I'm um, old fashioned, I love a, a good syllabus. And I don't, I, it seems to me that, that that isn't a common practice anymore. And I do think that there is some value for parents being informed of at more, more of the high school, upper school level to inform parents what the curriculum will be over the course of the year. So what they, they can understand the expectations, what the students are gonna hear and discuss. Um, I don't micromanage my kids so much, but I, I, do, I do like seeing a syllabus and understanding what that flow of educational work will be for the years. I don't know if, if we've gotten away from using a syllabus, but that I think, I think it would be good to communicate better with our parents. We do try to give our students independence and help them advocate for themselves, but parents want to be involved and they want to hear. So I, I don't know if there's, is, is there a way that we can better communicate to them what the, the coursework will look like for their student over the course of the year. Thanks, Mrs. Ritchie. I'll just add to that, Mr. Trenberg, in my 20 plus years of having kids in the district, um, the one thing that I remember, which was helpful, and again, it was different, but some more details, some not, but the open houses, you know, many times the teachers really laid out what the year looked like um, and kind of established, you know, what they would be doing in the dialogue with students. So it might be something to think about because I know they've, they've always been popular and well attended. It's been challenging over the last two years, but you know, I think Deb's uh, point is important, but I think that's also a mechanism that we can think of. You get that many people in the school, you get the teachers and the, the parents in the classroom. It's a good way to have some of that communication. I, Dr. Adam. I, I, I do think that uh, that's an important point uh, because how we collaborate with parents, particularly on this particular issue, um, in a, an honest, forthright way, because there's going to be more provocative 
critical topics that are going to come up and we click because by design they're going to come up that's what we want to do for the kids that's what's in the strategic plan so there is an onus on us to work collaboratively with our parents in the community to try and understand some of the topics that you're discussing and Ms. Richie, and some of the topics that the, the uh, community wants to discuss so we'll do that in a, an honest forthright uh, collaborative way and uh, if there's informational sessions or other things that we can provide um, we'll, we'll try and do that as best as we possibly can but it's, it's just important we, we, we do get it right because I don't want this to be the, the constant thing that we, we, we deal with moving forward and the other thing that came up here a little bit the more time we can give our teachers to work together the better and we don't do enough in my opinion uh, but that's not that's a whole other discussion um, because the more time we they can get together to discuss these types of issues, uh, the better it will be for, uh, for for kids in the classroom. Moment. But anyway, that's a different discussion for another time. Mr. Brown, all right, just a quick follow up, Alan. I, the strategic plan. I don't remember a section on provocative. So, is there anything that comes to mind when you say that, or could you highlight that, or give us a heads up as to what that may be? And if you can't do it now in the future, that'd be great. But I'm just curious by that comment. Interesting, challenging, critical topics. Could you give examples of any of these? Well, it could be controversial topics or from contemporary issues that have to be addressed uh, that that come up uh, that that involve. Uh, it could be of, of political nature, right? That, that needs to be discussed. In well, some I don't know. That's the term you use. Right? I'm asking you to give an example so I can follow. Up well, I just I, I, I don't want to to play on my word a little bit, but but we want the kids to be thinking about uh, significant topics. I just, has, I just had a discussion with the kid the other day that they were doing in uh, the science research project, which was all uh, to do with uh, uh, cells and protein in cells and how that would, uh, how that could be used in terms of parasites and different, uh, different illnesses and to improve that. And that's not, that maybe not controversial, but, uh, but there are, I just know that there's there's issues that are going to come up that are going to be you're going to have to take a side in something, right? You're going to have to try to defend a position, whether it's a position you want to defend or not, perhaps. And we just don't want to be in this position all the time. We have to do that. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Are you look you're looking for a specific example? I, Help me with a specific example, Chris, because it's just not coming to my mind right now. But that's fine. Yeah, I understand. I put you in the spot, but maybe sometime that'll be appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Any other further questions or board comments? All right. Again, thank you for the board conversation. Thank you for the parent conversation and feedback. Mr. Tranberg, thank you. Discussion to be continued. Discussion around curriculum committee to be continued. Um, this is a topic we have been focused on. We will stay focused on. It has been a challenging two years, but if you think of all the work that's been done and the fact that we transitioned most of our curriculum to the investment in technology we made and were able to execute what we did last year in terms of hybrid in-person remote learning. I mean, we have to take a minute, look back, pause, and realize all the good work that has been done, especially around the last year and a half to two years. So, so thank you all. Um, we will move along to uh, discussion on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, Dr. Adley and uh, Mr. Tranberg. I'm not going to say, Mr. Brown, that this is a controversial topic, but to some it might be. <laughs> I'm, sorry. I'm not going to say this is a controversial topic, but to some it might be. I'm actually glad that we have the opportunity here to actually uh, have an open discussion about this. Uh, I will say I'm, I'm very proud of the way the district has approached this topic and has approached the, the actual improvement process in general. The idea of doing that strategic plan in a thoughtful way in a measured way uh, uh, so that when we do start the process, it, it's got a thoughtful process behind it. And uh, so I'm, I'm very pleased that, that we've done that and uh, we haven't gone out and done something just like, okay, we're gonna do this or do that. Um, it, it has been delineated and approved that we, we take these steps. And this is the first step in the diversity, equity and inclusion. And Mr. Tramberg is gonna, gonna explain that, what some of those steps are. Yes. I'll say this topic is provocative and provocative is usually just meaning thought provoking. So I think if we're saying this is thought provoking, no matter where you're, what you're thinking is, it'll be provocative. Um, if you'll 
allow me, I'm going to zip through these relatively quickly again, and then we can focus more on the conversation um, side of it. Uh, but just the overview of this purpose of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And let me be clear, even though there's a picture of the planet there, I'm not talking about globally, I'm talking about very locally. Um, some of the work that's happened so far, um, the bulk of what tonight's about is building our own DEI team and what that team will do. And then um, part of that work is called experiences to explore equity. Uh, again, our vision and mission are our guiding forces in this. And I did pull out these two core values. Um, the first being equity. I will say in, in my experiences, it's not uncommon to see equity as a core value um, in, a, in a school district, but you don't always see the diversity and inclusion piece separately. They're often um, put together. So I, I just think it's, it just shines a light on the, the thought and care that went into the strategic plan and the approval of, of the process. So the purpose here is to, make, to bring our mission vision to life and our core values. Um, we want to operationalize our strategic plan, especially goal area two, um, understanding the root cause of inequities that may exist within and across communities, um, supporting the social emotional needs, which has been a common goal, uh, not only recently, but always, and develop a plan and process to address those inequities as we see them as the result of what the committee finds. So some of the work so far, our RESC workshops, so that would be CREC and CES, um, have offered some workshops over time and teachers have participated in those. Uh, last year, one of our opening keynote addresses was um, Ken Shelton, who we hope to continue working with. He's out in California. Um, he is uh, an expert in, in this area and he was well received by our faculty uh, for an opening keynote last year. Um, there's also been some book clubs and book studies that have been teacher led. And uh, I ran one as well with a group of interested people last year. And our CDSP, um, there, are, uh, there is a, a DEI like leadership team task force, and I might not be using the, the most appropriate language that they have in each school. So they have been doing work um, with the parents and the community to, to, um, to, to educate themselves. Uh, from a teaching and learning perspective, uh, when we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion and curriculum, because we've just talked about curriculum and obviously there's investment in care, um, commonly, like what does that mean for curriculum? It means these things, and this is similar to the New York framework. It's about what are we doing in our teaching to make sure we have that positive learning environment? How are we setting expectations for all learners, no matter what they bring to the table? And that's all differences. That's learning differences. That might be racial differences. That might be anything that they might face that um, might give them a challenge that other students don't face. Um, developing curriculum that are inclusive. The common language you hear about that is representative and portrayal. So as a student with learning differences, do I see myself in the materials? Do I see myself in the discussion? Am I represented in what we're doing? Um, and then again, supporting staff and the professional learning. Um, with a team itself, the team will look at um, in year one, the goal would be to first develop an equity statement. Um, and uh, I do want to echo Dr. Adley's statement of moving intentionally, because I will say, I've talked to plenty of people that might say they feel like I'm, I'm slowing them down. I'm not trying to slow anyone down with any work, but I feel like we have to do the work as a district and have a statement and a shared belief that we can use to guide us as we're doing this work. Because I don't think it's helpful when everyone is doing this work differently. Uh, and we don't have a common language to talk about what does DEI mean, specifically what does DEI mean for our community here. Uh, so the equity statement will be uh, phase one, um, an equity audit. So equity audit means looking at different categories and our data itself, how, when we look at students by these different categories, and I'll show you what those look like in a bit, um, do they perform differently based on perhaps their gender, perhaps their race, perhaps their financial need, um, and that is, um, often telling information on how we need to develop a plan or not. Um, and then the last part is developing equity networks. So that refers to the people that are actually on the DEI team. How are they relaying the information to people outside of the team? Because we don't want, there's no point of having a team if that work seems like it's living here and, and no one knows what's going on. So the network helps, I'll say, diffuse some of that information. Um, I will flip through this quickly, my slide kind of formatted in a funky way on the screen, 
Mm -hmm. um, but these are just some sample equity statements for your reference. Um, so when, and I used, there's a school, there's Ford, there's Google. So most companies right now are developing some type of a statement of equity that is used to guide their decision making when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's just a helpful part of the process, and it's how you share common language when you have a team working together to try to do that work for any organization. The audit categories. So these are typical research-based, um, the breakdown of what you would look at to try to understand where disparities might exist within a community or an organization. So you look at the climate and the common things under climate are to look at discipline. So are any groups of students um, uh, receiving suspensions, detentions more than any other group? Um, program means who, is to, who are the students that are taking AP honors gifted? Are some groups overrepresented, underrepresented? And then the obvious one of achievement. And those are some of the indicators we would look at. And then professional capacity. Um, it's often about the how are, how are minorities represented in the staff of the organization, and that goes to do students see themselves in the people that are leading and teaching them. And these are not from anything other than the common the common things that you look at now when you're doing an audit of this nature. And the equity audit itself, uh, the reason I put this up here is there's an extra. There's an extra dive that happens in an, in an equity audit that doesn't happen in most places. So we look at the data, and after we all look at the data, you're going to see, we will likely see disparities. It's just what happens. The group decides, well, what are the most important disparities that we as a guiding coalition for the district might be able to identify and do some more research to provide that information. Um, so they choose those key focus points. But before just choosing them, because they seem to be the outliers, like the most, oh my goodness, we need to do something about this, they learn more. And they go to, you might have saw the bullet on like root cause, like what's root cause? This is where we talk about root cause. It's like, well, why? What's the story of that group? Can we understand that better in order to take the most appropriate actions? Uh, so that's the working towards story, identifying the root cause, and then hopefully apply an intervention that removes that disparity and whatever that performance indicator is. The network itself, so that DEI team is at the center. And the goal is the DEI team is providing some guidance to the administration, then faculty and staff, students, parents, and the larger community. Um, I, I remember hearing a, a comment this evening just about just education of how as parents can we do this? And the DEI team would be just a helpful network in order to help people do that exact type of thing. And the last part of this is getting to story. Uh, every one of us around this table, everyone in the room has a different story related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And our experiences are all different. Um, so the reason that we invest time in a, in a DEI group is to build some common experiences. In some ways, we build those common experiences. We look at things together, like art, music, dance, current events. And then we have conversation about something that we've shared as a group. So we're not always bringing in all of the outside uh, interference that we have with our own story to help understand and create that common language. So that would be the work and the scope of the group. And I, I should say the, the big point of the presentation tonight is we really want to get this group going because it's a year one goal of our, our plan and we have people anxious to be part of the work. Thank you, Mr. Tramberg. We'll open it up to board questions and comments. Mr. Sini. Who's, who's part of that DEI team? Is it, is it all staff members, is it community members? Is a, a, a appointed board member on that DEI team? Um, there, there's no one yet because I haven't established it, but it will be um, staff, administration, um, students are a very important part of that team. Ideally, a board of education member and a community member that's not connected, a community member without children in the school is also provides another perspective that is usually um, helpful in diversifying how people uh, see the school and, and what the school portrays. Thank you. Chris, could you just add and talk to a little bit because I think it goes to people understanding what we're doing here. A lot of these groups have been formed in the elementary schools and they've started conversations and dialogue around this. Yeah, so the, there is a group at every elementary school and the middle school and the high school. 
And the work that they're doing is primarily to support each other as parents at this point. So in the parent community, you might have received an email that there is going to be a walk on the beach to talk about a DEI topic. You might have received an invitation to be part of a book club. Those are the things that are out there. Um, I have, I've met with them to say, please let us do the district work so we can make sure we're making clear connections and it doesn't feel like we have seven different things happening at seven different schools. And they've been wonderful and, and supportive in, in that. The group that participated in the CDSP meeting that came up, they're, they're very excited. It's an energized group of parents. So, you know, I think that will help the overall project as you kick it off. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Ackman. But to be clear, those groups, we, we keep saying CDSP, are PTO driven. They're not district driven. So, Correct. So the district has not yet put together its DEI. No, good okay. point. Thank you, Mrs. Ackman. Uh, Mrs. McCammon. So my question is in part that I'd like to hear more on another night for several reasons, one of which includes the time, but um, I'm having a hard time getting my hand around, head around exactly what an equity audit is. Uh, there are different ways that I can conceive of it. Um, certainly there's the academic impact and I think I understood there'd be multiple KPIs where you're looking at you know, the performance, uh, academic performance uh, and, and different reasons for variability there. Um, but it seems to me there's a second component where you're also looking at, you know, where you're talking about looking at the arts. Um, I'm not exactly sure. I'm, I'm hoping what that might mean, but I'm not exactly sure what you mean. So um, I'd love some clarification, probably briefly, but at some point, uh, a, a, a stronger understanding of, of what the audit is really intending to uh, explore. So the, the initial audit attempts to cast the widest net possible at looking at all kinds of different indicators. And when it's arts, that's, it's referred to as program participation. Mm -hmm. So are, uh, are certain populations of students participating in, so obvious ones, AP courses, honors courses more than others, but there's also, there's research tied to students who participate in arts, students who participate in sports, students who participate, so looking at uh, and that might turn out nothing. So th those often don't turn out too, you're probably not gonna have a huge indicator that students who participate in art are, is gonna be the focus of the district because we're gonna find something there, but it's, it's just part of a, like, initial, an initial white cast of, of what we might find. I don't, I don't know if I'm answering your question. Yes, can I just add a, a, a clarification? So if you're looking at arts, for example, are you looking to find out if certain cohorts are participating effectively or are you looking to find out people who are not maybe don't have access for some barrier yes so that can be an yes. indicator so we have let's say um students with learning differences part, uh, only four percent of students with learning differences participate in arts courses mm -hmm. and 85 percent of students mm -hmm. who have who do not have learning differences do not then we would say well that's a disparity where students don't have access to something mm -hmm. and then when we're doing that and we said that's something we're going to focus on we do the deep dive, we start going through the process, and then we might find things like, well, students with learning differences have more required programming as part of their day, mm -hmm. but that's not okay. And we wanna figure out how can we give more arts experiences to them? So then you'd have this coalition that would make a recommendation. Here are some ways that you can think about it. And they don't, the DEI committee isn't telling, telling administration, telling the board what to do. It's just saying, based on what we learned, these are the things that um, you might consider. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mrs. McCammon. Mr. Brown. Oh, um, so thank you. And again, if you, you don't have to give them to me tonight, but just a couple of questions from, from the review we just had. On the slide with the teaching and learning and the four bullet points there, I would just be curious to know how those are distinguished from what we do now. Um, that was number one. Number two, when we're talking in the slide of the core values and equity, and then we look at the scope, and I think it's slide nine of the community network, uh, obviously, as that scoping increases, some of these items are outside of the scope of school districts. So I'm not sure how you equate those two, um, how you would achieve that goal when some of the factors we've identified are not ones that we control. So that would be the second question. Again, doesn't have to be denied. Okay. And I'll hold. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Mrs. Stein. Sorry, I don't know why my microphone is fidgety tonight. Um, 
I think it's important that we sort of address another concern that was raised tonight that is a change in practice in our district, I believe from last year, which is the use of pronouns, students identifying themselves in classes with pronouns. Can you just talk about from a district level how that was related at the start of the school year to teachers? What is our sort of philosophy on it? What are we telling teachers and how is it being implemented? Sure, I can, I can tell you my understanding of that was teachers were presented with an option at the beginning of the year of one of the ways that you might get to know, think about one of the questions you may think about asking your students this year to get to know them included uh, these four questions, which what is your preferred name? Um, what pronouns do you prefer? Is it um, okay if I use those pronouns with your parents? And there's one more that is escaping me at the moment. Um, those questions mirror um, the questions that students are asked on their common app and they mirror questions that students are asked very often when they go to any college website and ask for information. Um, so I, I think the intent there was that readiness and getting them used to that being a question that they would ask. In my conversations with the high school counseling department, there have been more students that are coming um, with questions about gender expression and identity. And this was um, their attempt to, to, to try to start doing some of that work. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Stein. Mr. Maroney. Yeah, just going back to the to the review, and, and uh, I'm, I'm wondering what you foresee the board's role in this process. Where are the touch points with the board on, on this process? And how do we, how are we involved? Um, I would hope that there would be board representation on the committee itself um, that would serve as a liaison between the committee and the board, as well as board updates on uh, DEI. Uh, in the past, I've done annual presentations of with the committee itself of this is the work and this is what what we've done. So those are the two ways that jump to the front. Thank you, Mr. Maroney. Question? Mrs. McCammon. So in terms of process, do you is is there an audit that's basically ready to go and you just you just lift it and that's something that you kick off? If so, is that something that we could see so that we have a more concrete understanding of exactly what you're looking at. Please. Yes, absolutely. I can show you the, the template okay. and everything. So Chris, and one thing that just pops in my head, if I look at this community network and you've got the larger community, parents, students, faculty, staff, administration, and DEI team, as part of all this work, this comes up pretty much annually when we go through the budget process, we talk about hiring. I know uh, Ms. Sion and her team do an incredible job, but where does something like how are we doing or what are we doing about hiring and diversity? Like we, we supported the um, teacher and residency program this year. Um, I know questions have been brought up through not just the board, but other committees in town. You know, what organizations do we reach out to to look to hire um, and make the district more diverse in terms of our staff? I'll certainly, I'll invite Marge to jump in if, if I miss something on this. Uh, but last year we, or do you just want to take it? <laughs> but how, I guess, I guess that's fine. I, I'll take it from either of you, but how does it fit into this work? And uh, is, it, is it a component as we look across the district and we want to do all this good work? Like does some, where is something like that in this? Well, it, 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 I, can I just it real, real quick? It is I in think the, the three of you should flip a coin yeah, okay. and decide <laughs> who's going to speak. Go I'm trying to cut it off as quick as I can. If I can. Um, it's in the strategic plan on the professional uh, building the professional right. camp. So it's delineated there the action steps that we're going to take. It's maybe not in that part of it per se, but it, it's in the. It's but it's in got the, a. It's got all yes, work together. Yes, yes, it does. Yes, okay. Yes. All right. And Good. the state is also asking for minority recruitment yes. teacher plans, and I did attend some professional development with Marge. We attended several sessions last year, and obviously the board's investment in uh, partnering with. The interns through the CREC program are directly connected to what that goal would be. Great, thank you. Mrs. Ackman. So the goal of this, right, is to meet our goals in the strategic plan to make sure that our district is welcoming and understanding um, of different viewpoints. But I imagine through some of these um, processes, we might and I'm not saying we will, but we might hit upon some hot button topics, just like we're finding curriculum did. 
I would just ask that maybe we think about how when we do that, when we approach a subject that uh, might engender heated debate or be uncomfortable, or sometimes I find these things are generational, right? Like the kids are fine, the adults are not, or the, the kids are not and the adults are. Maybe we think about it so that we can, um, we just find ways to preempt it or to talk about it or to say, look, we, we've done this audit and we've actually found some things that are really interesting. Maybe we should hold some sessions because I think, again, a, a lot of, if we can communicate it out, if we can um, help people understand our thinking, your presentations tonight have been excellent. I think a lot of the people had they had these, maybe the temperature would have been a little lower. Um, on the curriculum issue. So I just ask as you go through this, if we find some things that we think might jump out, I think the idea of getting more kids into arts, you're not gonna find a fight of that, right? Most kids, people are gonna say, we'd love to do that. But there may be some that, that kind of engender some real um, tough conversations. And if there are, maybe we find a way or the administration finds a way to meet with parents at different levels and, and talk through their findings. Um, cause I, th I think that always helps. I generally find dairy in a community willing to learn, um, just looking for information. Thank you, Mrs. Ackman. Um, Mrs. Ritchie. Yes. So thank you, Mrs. Ackman. I, I just building on that, the parents are obviously a very important part of all of this process. So I think having them on the committee and, and getting perspective that way is, is very good. But again, I go back to my syllabus, but there wouldn't be a syllabus for, for something like this, but just keeping the parent community as informed as possible because we absolutely need them to partner with this and be invested with us in this process because it's important work. It's important to our schools, it's important for our students and it's important for our community as a whole. And I hope our larger community becomes part of it because it's important for everybody in Darien. So. Thank you, Mrs. Ritchie. Mr. Maroney. I just wanted to echo what Mrs. Ritchie said. I, there was a comment made at public comment for me which really struck struck a nerve is, is that just parents just need to be prepared. And I, and I think your syllabus idea is brilliant. And, and to me, somehow you need a syllabus on this. So, so parents aren't blindsided by their children coming with an uncomfortable topic where they're not prepared to have the discussion. And the more we can help parents be parents is, is beneficial to all. So I will say, I appreciate too, I think Mrs. Stein on the pronouns, Chris and I had a conversation with Dr. Adley and I think you know there's some lessons learned from that in terms of the communication, how it was rolled out. There was um, something to do with the app that required a response, which was not the goal. Um, it was to make kids, if they wanted to supply it, they could supply it. So, I mean, I think the reality is pronouns are here to stay. They're on LinkedIn, they're on Facebook, they're in your corporate directory, they're on the Common Act. I've traveled recently and. Everywhere I've gone from a restaurant to an airline, people have introduced themselves with their names and their pronouns. So I think, again, it goes to how do we help the community? How do we help the parents? And how do we communicate effectively uh, to everyone's points? So, good. Yeah. Mrs. Parent. Hi. Um, I just want to echo what everyone has said that this conversation is provocative for some, and it is uncomfortable for all. I mean, I think at some point, all of us will feel uncomfortable with some of these findings. And I think we as a community need to recognize that and respect other people's viewpoints and un uncomfortable feelings. But I think to your point, communicating wisely and often will hopefully temper the, the community and help them to understand that this work is important. It is important to every single person in this town. Thank you, Mrs. Perry. Mrs. McCammon. As uh, when you go to construct the committee, it's just, I was wondering if I see CDSP up there, but if you're also planning to talk to CPAC and DAG just to capture a full spectrum of neurodiversity. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. McCammon. Any other questions, comments, thoughts? Good. All right, uh, to be continued. I think we should also talk or hear from you as to the progress. I think we should move forward. Um, whatever you need from support from the board. And then we would, I would like to hear, I think the board would like to hear what kind of progress or updates, you know, we're gonna get throughout the, the process. So um, moving on, presentation and discussion on board master agenda for August, 2021 to February, 2022. So this goes through uh, February, it, it, it does show the first 
week of March here, I think. Um, so a couple of things about this, what I have included, hopefully captures some of what the board has been asking for. Uh, the school psychologists on ES, uh, SEL and the progress thereof and the needs that we've seen, that, that type of stuff. A progress report on NASC, the board goals, curriculum updates, strategic plans, open choice, talented and gifted. What isn't in here is uh, McBroom's annual report because we cut that out of the budget. Um, we have moved the, we've moved the grants earlier so that you see them before they're actually approved. Th that, those are the big highlights of of like things that has been structured. So happy to entertain a question. So first review, no action this evening, but I'll open it up for any board comments. Mrs. McCammon. These aren't sour grapes because I'm missing them alone in the broom report, but I am. Could you could you say that again? Yes. I'm, I don't know whether you need to move closer or, or farther. Further. Yes, let me know when I hit the right Pull the topic. mask out a little bit. Yeah. Um, um, Historically, when we haven't done, well, there's no historically, one time when we didn't do the Malone and McBroom report, we had just an approximation from administration just to make sure that we were, there weren't any changes. Um, I'm just asking that if we could please in November, just take another look at, at if we would be using our in-house enrollment model. Well, I have to use something. Yeah, but right. we have so, an in-house so, model, so, right? So I, I, can share, I can share it with you, the, uh, the Dr. Adley version of what we're coming up with. Yeah. So thank you, Mrs. Mc, Mrs. Ackman. Are we now doing Malone and McBroom every year? Well, no, we cut it this year, but no, no, I know. But even prior to that, we didn't do Malone and McBroom every year. We had our in-house model, but are we now paying them annually to do this for us? Well, well, we would we would recommend that we had this discussion before. I would recommend that we we do, but 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 you cut it anyway. Cut it. So there's nothing this year. Okay, it's rich. <laughs> well, no, but 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 Rich is well. Let me put it this way: the finance director. I'm not nothing against Rich, but the finance director regularly used to do that. Okay, I was getting a little confused. Thank yeah, you. so I just want to see it on the master agenda, although under with the understanding though that it's an in-house model. Yeah, and sour grapes. So that's okay. I would say uh, thank you, Mrs. McCammon, Dr. Adley, and uh, Mr. Rudel. Um, you know, we can have this as another agenda item or figure out if it's in a, in a committee, but, you know, based on where we landed with enrollment and the fact that everyone wants to move to Oxridge and have their kids in a brand new school, which I get, that's exciting. But I think let's think about at what point do we go back out to our community partners and talk to and get a better understanding of these developments? Because without these developments, without all these new apartments, we're still up an incredible amount of students. So I think we need, and there's another potential 150 apartments up near Selleck Woods that's being proposed. Mr. Genovese's property has started, Federal is well on its way. Palmer's is moving forward from what I understand, finally. Um, and I don't know what else may be down the path, but as the town turns over and you see that type of increase in a specific district, in terms of number of kids moving in, I think this is something we have to spend a little more time on. You'll, for, you're like, you'll forgive me if I just say that that's what a demographer does, right? Um, and it's not what I do, but... <laughs> nice <laughs> job! I'm just saying. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, then yeah. well, I... So we're saying the board needs the... the yeah, that was, so the well, last, I, I, the last the one end of the, take, room one takes into account many of those. The plans yeah. for those have not <laughs> changed. <laughs> And I would say we typically get an October 1st update in-house or not. I'm with Mrs. McCammon. I would like to see it. I think it helps us as we start thinking about the budget. Yes. Thanks. And I would say if for some reason you see a need to do that, then I would expect you to come back to the board and request us to look at that and possibly allocate the resources to that. If you think that's important, that's what Everybody I would expect. <laughs> I did. It's just reality. <laughs> All right. So the master agenda will come back to us. Please read it. Any comments, you know, for them on. Uh, we will move toward action items, personal items. Uh, Ms. Sion, um, looks like 
Ms. Sign continues to do a little bit of work on a daily basis in terms of um, hiring. <laughs> we did have some last minute resignations, which is always unsettling, but okay. this, this should be it. We did have one additional teacher at home who signed a contract after this was posted. So she'll be on the agenda for next month. Okay, great. Uh, motion to just approve the PAR. Deb, uh, second by Mrs. Parent. All those in favor, that is unanimous. Thank you. Uh, we will move now to public comment. Michelle. Good evening. If you would like to speak during public comment, please click the participants icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Next, click the raised hand option. The facilitator will identify you. Please state your name and or address. You will have up to three minutes to comment. Liz Riva, you are unmuted and recognized. Okay, hold on. Ms. Riva, can you hear us? Yes, hello, can you hear me? Hi, yes, we can hear you, thank you. Just Hi. state your name and address, please. So I'm Liz Riva, and I'm at 160 Ridge Acres Road. Thank you. Um, so thanks for letting me speak real quickly, I know it's late. Um, I have students in the middle school and the high school, and I'm also a former elected official of the town of Darien. I volunteered as a member of the planning and zoning board, and I know how much time and effort volunteering takes, so I thank you all on the Board of Ed for your time. I just wanna go back because I was not able to join the meeting from the very beginning, and I heard some speakers before, and I wanted to speak tonight about back to the topic of these materials, assuming that these are what I'm talking about, the materials that were handed out to students in the middle school and the high school that I found very offensive. Um, and I heard some speakers um, talking about in diversity and inclusion, which I, I feel like I don't understand. That had nothing to do with what people are protesting about today, about these materials. So I want to just say that these materials are really inappropriate and they were really offensive. I'm appalled that teachers on our staff had such a lack of judgment to have sent these out to our students. Um, I'm appalled that there were no oversight of these materials. I watched the rest of your meeting and uh, heard Mr. Chamberg with the PLC with thousands of materials in it, which would be difficult to go through. Well, it needs to be gone through. And I was reminded by, um, I forget who it was who mentioned that a couple of years ago, there was some materials about the Middle East and Palestine. My daughter was actually in that class and I wrote an email to the principal of the middle school about how offensive the materials she was assigned to read in sixth grade were. So whatever this PLC was, it does need oversight and it needs to be gone through. I don't want to debate that these materials are offensive. And I don't want to talk about how wrong it was for teachers to have students apparently go up and write their names under their political affiliation. We're going to go round and round if we do that. What I want to state is that there should be no opinions in the classroom or biases in the classroom whatsoever. There shouldn't be. There's no room for it. There's no room for preaching and for truly being not inclusive and being divisive to people. And it's ironic to me that some of the speakers earlier, I only saw the last, I think, four of them in the public comment, were discussing how you know diversity and inclusion must be um, obviously presented within this, our students and that protesters were against that. Absolutely not. It's the opposite. Our objection is that there's been a lack of almost inclusion. Up, Mr. Thank you. Your time is almost up. Go ahead. Well, what I wanted to say was, I think that yes, there should be some consequences. I think there should be clear policy to keep our curriculum fair and unbiased. That's it. Policy stated that teachers and administrators need to know that materials cannot be biased. And then I think absolutely there needs to be oversight. Thank you, Ms. Riva, your time is up. Thank you. All right, thanks. Jackie's iPhone. You are unmuted and recognized. Can you hear us, Jackie? You need to unmute. All right, thanks. I think we just did. Uh, yeah, I, I want to echo the last please, part. I've been uh, sir, please state your name and address. Thank you. 
Bill Lenich, one Siwanoi Road, and we've been here for the whole call. And we've watched the whole meeting, and we appreciate all your time and effort and all this. But what we've really seen is just platitudes, vagaries. When it comes to the curriculum, it's really not about vagaries and platitudes. It's about specifics. And whoever that guy is who, who's out there talking about what we need to do and what we want to do, it's quite frankly embarrassing. And what hap- what has to happen is clear curriculum, clear guidelines, and accountability. That's all we're asking for. Thank you, sir. Michelle? There are no more raised hands at this time. Great, thank you, Michelle. Again, thank you everyone for coming in person. Thank you for everyone on Zoom. Thank you for all the conversations um, and all the questions from a board perspective. Thank you for all the presentations. We'll continue to move this forward as a community with open dialogue. Thank you. May I have a motion to adjourn the meeting, Mrs. Stein, second by Mr. Sini. All those in favor?